Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call the Amherst Select Board meeting of November 20th, 2017 to order at uh, 632 to be precise. Um, this evening we have a couple of scheduled uh, items on our agenda that were noticed in the paper, um, but we will not get to those until 7 o'clock. Uh, and so we're going to start with our usual, but we'll start first with the announcements or agenda review. Does anyone have anything they need to announce or make note of relative to our agenda? Other than not that we're aware of. All right. So we'll start with public comment. Um, as is usual with public comment, we generally limit people to about three minutes. We won't generally react or, or, or uh, ask questions of the persons that are speaking to public comment, but we certainly are well we do w welcome you to come and speak to us about things. So do we have anyone here for public comment? Seems as though we do not. So we'll get right into our agenda. We have, like I said, something at seven o'clock. So we'll start with, with um, our action discussion items. I think the, the first thing we have on there is our fiscal year 2019 budget policy guidelines. Uh, you would have received on your desk tonight a copy, mm -hmm. but also hopefully via email from me yesterday late afternoon early evening uh, so hopefully everyone's had a chance to review it and if I can find my copy um, so I was I'm suggesting that if anyone has any comments or edits that they would like to offer I will make note of those and we could potentially yes you're you're literally jumping right into this Absolutely. which is what we talked about but that was be when I thought I was going to look at it earlier than Sunday evening so could you give us a sense of because there's always a variety of ways to do these things what you changed because um, this isn't a track changes version yes this is not a track change version so I will tell you that there was in section one on overall philosophy and key concerns uh, there was a uh, an item that was removed that was now I can't recall what it was about but it was removed because it's not relevant so much anymore it was very specific and no longer necessary I don't think um, and then we added at the so end which section the very first section it was like I this is last year's oh, okay so we took out thank you uh, there was a there was a whole section on the seasonal shelter um, Which was? continuation of seasonal shelter for homeless individuals in important community need and we anticipate continued staff support even though we no longer provide direct financial assistance to that operating budget so that was item I and that was item one. I previously it and it got pulled out altogether because I think it's since it's no longer in the budget it's we can add it back if, if people feel the need to and then we added so everything after that got moved up one mm -hmm. and then a new M as in mouse uh, got added that has to do with um, uh, if the uh, charter question passes and, and a new government is formed what we need to do in in regard to that um, so that was the significant change there and I think outside of that Anything else was really quite minor. I'm trying to think if there was any other significant change that I'm trying to recall. I don't think so. So that was the that was the primary one and I did get a couple of edits from Mr. Seinberg before the meeting, which I will share with people if they would like or if they need a few minutes to read through. So for me, by the time this came electronically, I was done looking at my packet. I wasn't able to give it as much attention as I might. I'm just jotting down notes of the thing, two things that occurred to me, but um, it would have been good to have like a version where I could see what that changed because right. I didn't know I mean what you mentioned just now isn't big but I had right. no idea what was not here or right. added or taken away because I so was a little so what I can do is if if folks feel like they need to review it a bit more I fully intended to get it to you a full day ahead of when I did so we're in no, no tremendous pressure to necessarily 
approve this this evening, we can wait a week or so. Yes. With, with that understanding, I think we probably all do still have some comments, whether or not I, for example, had been keeping some lists of comments that I'm not sure where they fit. So I can't right. say this is new item K, right. but we can at least get right. that oh, no, to absolutely. you. As you said, Mr. Steinberg already got you some edits and we could give you some more now. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we not right. have a conversation right. about it. I'm just yeah. saying no. we don't have to vote for it no tonight pressure. if we need to sort of... But they're not all written out in perfect, you know... Yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely. Right. Place. Absolutely. So why don't I start with Mr. Steinberg since he had a couple of things he wanted yeah. to offer. Right. So I'll let him sort of explain what he had as far as changes and see if that meshes with okay. other things that people are have noted or not yet noted or okay um, they're all minor edit type of things so I'm going to be relatively quick about them because they're I don't think substantive but in the uh, new section in section M um, I was wondering about including the words along with prioritized recommendations for service adjustments um, I guess that I would prefer not to assume that if um, we get to the situation where the charter passes and we're scheduling an election, that it's necessarily going to require a service adjustment. And I think that that's implicit um, in any budget change anyway. So I would have tended to not include that. Um, on the second, uh, on uh, section four, or other new revenue, um, we're in B, I would say, um, especially about the creation of housing and commerce. The reason I put that in there is because uh, the UTAC um, is, when they've been going through those projects, is not just looking at housing, but at other kinds of development. So. Not sure it's the perfect wording, but I felt it needed to say more than end housing. Mm -hmm. Under F, um, I'm not sure that I see any need to, for the words that follow the um, mandated costs. Um, the rest of that um, mm -hmm. seems to me could be deleted. Um, and under capital, uh, which is, I think, the last thing I had, uh, it just the introductory sentence under capital. The select board recognizes the perils of inadequate investment in maintaining our physical assets and in improvements. And then I would do a period and start a new sentence. We remain committed and then go from there. Um, okay. But I wanted to make sure that capital is not just about building, but it's also maintaining physical assets. Could you say that one again? It's in the, in the intro to, to five? The intro to five. Select board the select board recognized the perils of inadequate investment in maintaining our physical assets and in capital improvements. Okay. And then I would put a period... Uh, we remain committed and then finish it totally. It's just breaking into two sentences since uh, once I added to that, it seemed awfully run on and long. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you raised your hand. You were uh, just no, I will, but I, I think Mr. Wall does. Oh, just, oh, this is just a general item for a thought, you know, since we're talking about the knowns and the known unknowns and unknown unknowns and all that, uh, given that this zero energy requirement has been imposed upon us now, that may have serious budgetary consequences and it may also force us to make choices and give up other things. So maybe just a reminder to the effect that we should keep our eye on that as we go forward. I had a few in it. In fact, that was one of mine also, is to have a place that talks about <clears throat> the impacts of the net uh, zero energy law and also um, um, 
maybe it goes under capital, but it may go somewhere else. Um, looking at um, new long range um, capital projects. So H under one concerns H is uh, debt repayment, major capital projects are listed now considering elementary school, Jones Library, South Fire Station, and public works facility. Um, I wanted something that captured things that were even further out, so we, we talked about this, getting them on the horizon. Um, that might be a community slash senior center, or it might be uh, a private-public partnership in a parking garage, whatever they are to start um, Finding a way to identify them, um, and similarly, where do we stick the North Amherst Library in here so that it's called out in some way? Um, then I looked at L about the institutions of higher education on strategic partnership, and I was wondering if there was a way to make that more robust. Um, and something maybe about funding for social services and how we had made it kind of a project to be identifying that in our in our budgetary discussions um, and then someplace and maybe it's a v capital about the jcpc process about um, looking at um, and are reviewing that process to make sure there's adequate opportunities for um, input to the capital planning process. And I, I can go on, I, I think you all know what I mean, it's kind of a shorthand, but I, so I won't go into it now, but I just wanted, these are sort of markers that I thought we might want to get in here. That's all I got. When you're done writing, <laughs> okay. since you're the one who's incorporating that's all right. this, I don't want to cut you off while you're still working on no, that. That's all right. So many of mine are similar to the others, and so without, again, we haven't all handed you sentences associated with that, and I don't have any intention of doing so. I just want to correct it <laughs> next time you write it. Um, but right. along those lines, I'm guessing at this point, just in terms of the way we have this structured, that most of those might end up as N's, O's, and P's in the first section right. as being key concerns as opposed to necessarily fitting into expense reduction, economic development, other new revenue, capital, and reserves. They might not fit in there, although if we can, if, if it helps, if the town manager looks at it with you and says, oh, actually this fits here, then that would be fine too. Right. Um, I'm, so I'll make hopefully a couple of brief points. So under item one, the overall philosophy and key concerns, under item H, Ms. Kruger mentioned things on the horizon that we keep hearing about, like the community center, senior center, parking, North Amherst Library even. I want to make sure that H remains separate because those are the four projects yes. we've been talking about for years. And then some other statement that says along the lines of, for example, we need to ensure that the other things people are talking about are visible someplace that they can see them. And so, um, not sure, but to make another, it, it's its own phrase. I mean, we, we got all the way from N to Z here, so we got lots of options. <laughs> Plenty of letters left. Um, we can just double them up. A whole bunch of letters. I just don't want it to be mixed into the same thing. And then the North Amherst Library, I think, is yet another separate thing. And I don't know where that fits, but that is a separate item also. So when I see this again, I'm hoping that those will both be separate issues that are listed in here. Just as we've talked about now repeatedly, the JCPC process, which again is still separate from the North Amherst Library issue, completely separate in fact, as was just experienced, but that there is a way of addressing the process, even though I know these are budget policy guidelines, in order to get out what we want from the capital plan, we're going to need to have addressed that. So it's kind of, I guess it fits in the overall thing rather or than necessarily the capital section because it's more of a, a shift in focus in how we do some of the physical things. Because we have a great process, but we need to figure out a way to let more people into it and when that would work and when it would make sense. 
So I think that's really helpful. And I'd like to emphasize maintenance a lot more than I really appreciate what Mr. Steinberg added, but there needs to be a whole separate section about maintenance because we're not doing it. And whether it turns out that because the way town manager writes the budgets, it makes more sense for some kinds of maintenance to be in operating versus capital because it's small amounts for this, that, or the other thing, I think that's fine. But I think we need to be able to point to things and say, this is where we're doing maintenance of playgrounds. This is where we're doing maintenance of downtown crosswalks. This is where we do maintenance of this. And maybe some of it needs a big slug of money from JCPC and maybe it doesn't. But we are hearing more and more from people about they can't find any place in the budget that we're doing it and that's because we all know we're not able to do as much as we'd like associated with that but where's a place they could look for it and then i think we need a separate item i'd made a note before about community choices aggregation under article 16 we need to put a comprehensive energy plan into this somewhere because of the the item so maybe that's another beginning thing you know somewhere in there we need to add the comprehensive energy plan to this year's guidelines that we'll need to see some progress doesn't mean everything gets done like and it's over but that that needs to mm -hmm. be in there someplace <coughs> mm -hmm. and i know it would have been anyway at jcpc but we i think it's important that we recognize it up front here and along those lines is there any place in here that we talk about that we that that would make sense, even though it's capital. What we've learned so far about the firefighter study, is there any way we mention that in context of something else? Or because we didn't really have those answers when we wrote the evaluation. I don't know where else we're gonna put it if we don't talk about it here. I mean, I know we talk a lot about capital here. We talk more about things. But in terms of people, like we've talked about the homeless shelter before, we've talked about the pool before someplace in here how do we recognize that we we're ex will expect to see something <laughs> uh, related to the results of the firefighter study and the next steps associated with that in the budget that comes out it'll it surely was going to have some text about that someplace um, in addition to possible <coughs> it's important that people have, you know been all waiting for that and wondering where that fits so it's more about it's not implementing the study, you know, it's right, not right, like right, that, right, it's, right. but it's finding a way to provide context for next steps of what that's gonna look like, if right. nothing else. In, in some ways it's about, it's about uh, in that one in particular, but I think there's some others that are in the same, same boat mm -hmm. that, like with the energy planning as well, those are both things that are in that sort of introductory letter uh, in the budget, where it usually is several pages, and most of it's about sort of the specifics of the coming fiscal year but there are also some um, generally some remarks regarding trajectory of certain kinds of things you know pressures on the budget over a long period of time that sort of thing and that would probably be also where some of this could be folded into that, that cover memo that goes with the, with the budget but there may actually be you know you may have more sort of meat on the bones as it were relative to these things if you know sort of what your expectations are in future years Mm -hmm. um, around those things, but yes. Oh, it went on so long. I thought of one more, but um, yeah. I mean, some of this is the sort of overarching philosophy, and some of this is kind of our list of things don't fall off, and we're track we're keeping track of things. But mm -hmm. um, we've heard a couple times from the manager about the um, healthcare trust fund and looking at that and coming up with solutions and we may want to similarly to some of these other things noted in here so that it, it, it acts as a reminder and a tracking because it probably goes under expense reduction but i will leave that to the writers okay yeah there is a there is um oh aggressive cost comparison, reducing waste, and seeking greater efficiency <laughs> is kind of broadly a category of, of descriptors that fit that. And then also the next one, which is negotiation of fair labor contracts, um, because that's certainly a, an intimate part of those, of those negotiations and, and the cost. So that's under expense reduction, but it's certainly worth calling out specifically since we know. How it, yes. 
So I guess I'm trying to, um, as we talk, get more in more detail on this, and these are supposed to be budget policy guidelines, and it seems like it's becoming a list of, don't forget to mention, like what do you, when you say the firefighter study or the, I'm looking for, I understand I need to address those things, that's already on my list, but if you have guidelines for what you'd like to see accomplished, that would be useful. If that, if you have pre, if you have already, you know, have ideas on what you want to see addressed, um, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to distill what this document is designed to do. Well, I think part of the challenge there is that we don't have any other place to give you a list, whether or not you've what, had what a I, list I'm sorry. or not. We don't have another place to give you a list of specific goals. things. Performance goals. Performance goals. Then goals, goals. But those we tend to try and split off the budgetary things into this document so that they're not completely repetitive of one another. So it, there's more art to this than science, absolutely. <laughs> and there are also absolutely conversations that the select board had in the past prior to your tenure that didn't end up mentioned one way or another in the budget at all that we thought were continuing ongoing issues. So, you know, in hindsight, if we could have captured more of these in the performance goals, and that would have made more sense to you to put them in there to show, again, we try not to micromanage the how, but the what thing we want at the end. I can appreciate that the, these are titled guidelines, but there's, if we didn't get them in the performance goals and we don't put them in the guidelines, then they aren't any place. So the performance. If they better the performance, mm -hmm. we can and so the right. And if so, if that if that's more appealing, we, we could do that. But I, I can't see not mentioning it. And I think one of the things that we could talk about at length about. some other time, not tonight is more what some of these things mean to us. And so some of these things you might, we might phrase, and to some extent they already fit, like you said, under here in terms of healthcare cost containment, kind of already fits, so why call it out? Well, it's a special year, that's why, because you're going out, which is not something we do every year. You're going out to find out what the other costs are, and we uh, continue to have amazing work with our insurance advisory committee, which we wanna make sure you know is clear to everybody that's been terrific, and that's part of the whole negotiation process. But there's also the thing we could talk, an example of something we could talk about at more length is maintenance. We, we st have struggled with this the whole entire time I've been on the select board. And the best we usually are able to come up with is there are a lot of unmet, unmet needs in maintenance. And like that's where it says. <laughs> so that's not really what I'm looking for this time. And so I understand we have budget constraints. I mean, we know that. We saw the Finance Committee's guidelines but people don't understand why we're not maintaining things better. So I'm trying to reflect that in terms of saying, if, if everything is just a generic guideline, then to me it almost, there isn't a point to it because it, it isn't specific. It's like, make sure you have good contracts. Well, sure, obviously, I mean, who wouldn't do that? And so that's why I think it's important that we're able to say some specific things, all where, where they fit and, how they come out and maybe it's a conversation the two of you need to have more about what will it look like if this because no one says we do say when we do your evaluation this is one of the documents we look at mm -hmm. it isn't just the other document it isn't just the performance guidance we look at this one too but it doesn't say you'll have built a new fire station I mean that's that's not the guideline it's making progress so I don't know if there's another way to approach that we, that we just haven't thought of yet that maybe you can think of Other comments. So what I think I will do is I'll take the feedback you gave tonight, which I'm glad we had because I was not recalling. Some of these we've mentioned before and I just didn't get them incorporated, but others there's some more specifics that have that have um, surfaced a little bit. And I think that's not that can be useful. And and so um, what I will endeavor to do is to take these comments and fold them in. Um, and if there's something that starts to sort of clearly break to where it's like, you know, this really probably ought to go in goals and maybe we'll revisit mm -hmm. that as well as an option to sort of modify the goal list. But there's some of these that I think are sufficiently uh, less specific to remain in a, in, a, in a budget policy guideline. So I think I'll try to uh, strike the nuance of those things and yet incorporate the sort of intent of, of, of your comments and, and get those folded into the document. And so um, the good news is that 
this being a vacation week, there's potentially more time when I'm not <laughs> doing other things. Don't do you feel free yeah. to give up more family time. <laughs> Should be okay, but uh, the, the four meeting. Yeah, the, the goal will be to, for me, is to get these back to everybody in advance of the 12-4 meeting so that they and When can, everyone else is watching the game after yeah. the Thanksgiving dinner, you'll be doing this? That'll, that'll, it won't be on Thanksgiving Day. That much I do know. <laughs> Perhaps the Friday is going to be otherwise occupied. Um, is there anything else anyone wanted to mention? And, and if you think of something later, feel free to send it along to me uh, individually, and I'll, I'll seek to incorporate that in, into the... Uh, into this as well so I think that I mean there's lots of this in which it hasn't changed and so it's still providing guidance to, to Mr. Bachman even though we're getting into the middle of the year mm -hmm. and close to your deadline for creating a budget so you're we're still well, in the, well in the mix yeah. but, but hopefully it'll still uh, provide you some guidance sure. in time for, for it's not like he year. forgot any of the things we listed but right. we might forget them <laughs> right exactly so with that I think we'll we'll um, almost seven o'clock and so let me look at my list of things here um do you think we can get the winter parking update no, no. In, the, in the three minutes till seven o'clock <laughs> yeah, we could do the consent calendar we could do appointments appointments, all right appointments, yeah. we that. so we could do the appointment under number five if mr steinberg would be so kind since he maybe found the language for the appointment yes it was going to be three years okay i moved to appoint Paul Golston to the CDBG Advisory Committee through June 30, 2020. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? This was on the agenda, but for some reason didn't make it onto our motion sheet. But this was the motion that we intended for a three year term on CDBG Advisory. And um, we interviewed Mr. Golston. We still have openings on that committee. If other people are interested, please complete us as an activity form because this just gives them quorum and they're about to head into their busy season. So if other people are interested in serving on that committee, it's a little tricky because it's one of the committees that if you're interested in this sort of thing, you tend to be on a board of some sort of social or service agency already, which Might makes for a conflict. Yeah. So, um, but we appreciate Mr. Golston's uh, application I think we should move forward with it and I want to just remind people that it being their busy season they are looking for more members as well all right any other comment hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed no. it's unanimous <coughs> and so I believe we're close enough to seven o'clock to start our public <coughs> hearing on the property tax classification so I probably have to formally open this hearing Mm -hmm. A motion of such. Yeah, there's a motion on the motion sheet, I believe. Yeah. It was. We have on the previous yeah, version. The ad. <coughs> well, just, it, just, it just has the time, the right date opened. So it's 7 p.m. Does this help? Oh, we have the ad itself. Yeah. Right. If you read it, that'll yeah. All right. It covers you, but it's nice. So there was a public notice regarding this hearing, which I will read. The Amherst Select Board, which is us, will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 20th at 7 p.m. town room to Amherst Town Hall for the purpose of determining this current year's tax allocation between the five classes of taxable property, residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property. And there's a, you can call the Board of Assessors if you need more information or <laughs> we're gonna find that out right now. So I'm gonna call the hearing to order. You take a vote to go into that? At seven o'clock. And so, Mr. Burgess, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for inviting us again. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to uh, tell you that we now have a full board for the first time in a little while. Uh, two of my members are behind me uh, Mr. Morse, who's the chairman, and Mr. Hargreaves, who's uh, been freshly appointed today. He was sworn in. <laughs> and this seems to be becoming a habit becoming a habit that our new appointees are show up at the classification hearing. <laughs> this is the second year in a row. So we are very happy we've got a full board. Mr. Hargreaves is filling out the term of Jeffrey Morgan until 20, uh, June 30th of 2018. The other thing I'd like to say before we start is that this was recertification year. So kind of good news, bad news, the tax rate's going down, your value's going up. <laughs> so that said, <clears throat> The purpose tonight is, as you said, to vote on the, uh, whether you're going to adopt a residential factor of one or some other factor. 
whether you're going to adopt an open, uh, open sta space tax rate, which we don't have any open space, so that won't happen. And if you're going to uh, vote a commercial exemption or a residential exemption. Uh, the tax rate, if we leave it at 100%, as a single factor of one, will be $21.14 going forward for 2018. If you chose to sh uh, shift the burden by 50% onto the commercial properties, you could do that. And at this time, I'm going to own up to a typo on page two. At the, at the top of the page, in the first table, that should be 1985 and 3171. Uh, where, where are you? What, what are you changing? Uh, top of page two, mm -hmm. on the first table, mm -hmm. the residential tax rate on the right in the bottom column should be 1985. I'm sorry, instead of what are we, we're on page two. Two, top table. Top table, which line? Third line. Third line, instead right. of? 1982 should be 1985. Ooh, okay, thank you, got and it. And 3171 instead of 3167. 3171, got it, thank you. That'll change everything. Everything. Now, if we uh, go forward with the single property tax rate, the single, average single family value will raise from 334600 to $353,000 this year. That will mean there will be $159 change in the tax rate, or sorry, in the taxes for that property, or about 2.17% increase over last year. For the commercials, the um, commercial will be 400, go from 433700 to 484,000, and their uh, value, tax value on that pro taxes on that value property will go up by $776, or about 8.1%. The reason for that is that the commercials took a larger uh, increase in valuation this year than residential over uh, single families did. Residential single fa single families went up about five to six percent. Commercial went up about 11%. If you chose to shift the burden and adopt full 50% increase on the commercial tax, that would gives a tax rate of $19.85 on the residential and $31.71 on the commercial, which would lower the uh, residential from 7,462 to 7,007, but at the same time it would raise the commercial valuation Tax from 10,244 to 15,367. So that is a large increase for a very small saving on the residential property. So that is one of the points you have to weigh tonight. As I said, uh, you could select a discount for open space. As I say, every year we do not uh, have an open space class of property. The valuations uh, are on the large areas of land are either covered under chapter land, 61, 61A or 61B, or because it's on buildable, we already discounted very heavily uh, to a very low rate, so it's, there's no point in having an open space. You have one more, two more options. You could grant the residential exemption, which would mean for owner-occupied properties, you could adopt a uh, amount that would average out at $68,981 if you took a full value, uh, full allowance of 20% and take that off the tax rate. And that would lower the tax rate, or lower the value on those properties, but at the same time it would raise the tax rate inside the residential class. We have never done that, uh, but that is an option you have. If you did the, if you did, sorry, if you did the maximum shift, the tax rate would go to $24.55 on the residential properties. This, the, uh, properties such as apartment complexes would not get the benefit of the exemption, but they would have to pay on the $24.55 instead of $21.14. The small commercial exemption is um, an exemption of up to 10% of the property valuation, which can be granted to commercial, but not industrial properties that meet the requirements set forth under the law. I'm gonna to have to read this because I don't really know it that well. To qualify, eligible businesses must have occupied the property as of January 1st, 2017, 
and must have had no more than 10 employees as certified by the Department of Employment and Training during the previous calendar year, and the building must have a valuation of less than a million dollars. We do not have any properties to meet that guideline. Most of our commercial properties are uh, occupied by businesses, by a business other than the owner, so they wouldn't qualify. And those are your options for this year. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Mr. Steinberg. Um, I don't think I'm going to recommend the residential uh, exemption, but I did have a couple of questions just so that their information is out there before uh, I finally conclude that. If, the, if it is adopted and the rate goes to 2455, as a policy matter, that also pushes us close to $25. Can I address that one first? Yes. Sure. No, it does not push us close to $25. The $25 is based on what the English average, what the, what the sing, signal tax rate would be at 100%. So it would be the 2114 that you start from. It would be the base to compare to $25, not the 2445. It would be the overall allowable tax rate, not any tax rate that's subject to adjustment. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful to know. Um, that would in of itself been a showstopper probably, <laughs> but uh, um, it then gets to the second. Uh, I was trying to sort of put my head around what the policy reasons would be for doing this and why it has been done in those small number of communities you cited. And I just wonder if you had any comments on that. I have a, yeah. The largest community that adopts a residential exemption is Boston. Boston also adopts a split rate at a high rate. I think they're at 175%. They have a special legislation. So therefore, when you do the residential exemption, it has very little impact on the residential tax rate because the tax rate has already been lowered. <coughs> and the other communities along the, the um, Cape communities that have it, they have a large number of out of Mm -hmm. uh, town owners, so, and they, because their so, values are so high, they have taken the prime properties, they pick up the burden for the smaller properties in the town, so they're events, essentially taxing the out-of-towners more than they are the local people. <coughs> that's, that's helpful, thank you. Other questions? Just to say that I appreciate that you go over that with us every year because people, you know, when they just glance at it, they do think, well, why don't we do that? And that's exactly why. And that the, the landlords the situation that we have, our second home situation, tend to be people here in town. So it, it, we can't just soak the out of town people. We haven't yeah. figured out a way to do that yet. And the, you know, also in those communities, they may not have as many rental properties as we have with people with lower incomes. And if we put a higher tax on the commercial properties, than our residential apartment complexes, I somehow or other think it'll get passed along. Right. Other questions or comments? I suppose we need to close the hearing in order to mm -hmm. take the motions. Yes, Is that correct? There's any public comment. Are there any public comment or questions regarding this? Hearing none. Um, I move to close the public hearing. Second. All right. All at uh, time, 7-11. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So we've closed the hearing at 7-11. And so there are a series of motions that we should take action on if, if we so choose. Would someone care to offer those? Ms. Kruger. Okay. Um. I move to adopt a minimum residential factor of one, equal tax rate for all classes of properties for fiscal year 2018, and that no open space discount be granted. Second, and there's a second. Is there further discussion? Well, I just, in case someone's watching and is confused, even though Mr. Burgess says, it, it doesn't mean we don't have open space in town, and it's, 
it, it's treated differently. We just don't have that as it, one of our tax categories, and that's why we're taking it out. But it, it can be really confusing to a layperson. Why, why are we doing that? It's, because it's just, um, it's not within our system. It doesn't mean we don't recognize open space and we, we deal with its value differently within right. the system that we have. Right. Thank so you. To add that. For the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. I guess I'm in the middle here. Huh? Yes. Uh, I move to not adopt a residential exemption, exemption for fiscal year 2018. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Since we just had this a moment ago, <laughs> I think we're still thinking. fresh. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. So that's unanimous as well. And we have one more. Third one. I move to not adopt a small commercial exemption for fiscal year 2018. Second. And there's a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous as well. Thank you very much. That's a good question. Yes. So, which I am quite confident you covered at the beginning while I was looking up something else. I'm not going to lie. Um, so, our report says 2114. Yeah. That's our new rate. When you talked to us back in September, you were said it was going to be 21. You were guessing. You know, you weren't, it wasn't done yet. It was 2103 because we're at 2183 mm -hmm. now, right? right? And it was going to be 2103 probably. And it's 2114. Is there anything to be said for that? Yeah, there's two things to be said for that. Mm -hmm. We actually raised a little bit more in new growth than we thought we were going to have at that time. I was expecting about 700,000, and we ended up with about 760,000. So that gives a little bit more taxable space. And we used that, and I did change some valuations during the informal period okay. that we had, uh, so that lowered the values. And as you know, it's a, just a mathematics. All right. Sorry. I mean, it, it's really close. <laughs> 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 That's what you get for giving us a preview, right? So, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I will you. say, Mr. Bockelman has a form for you to sign, and Excellent. I'll take care of that in the morning so we can get this done. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. We thank do have you. the forms in our. Our signature folder for tonight. So before we leave, we'll, we'll sign off on that and a few other things. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who worked on this. And thank you to the the members of the uh, of the board there that came in this evening. I appreciate you spending the time to come by and support Mr. Burgess and ourselves as we make our choices. All right. So that takes care of it. So now, should we get into winter right. parking? Yeah. Or winter parking is fine. Sure. Yeah, why don't we do the winter parking update, which I don't think will take too, too long. Okay. But we're going to start with uh, winter parking update, which begins so end of next week. Yes, December 1. Um, the You have a memo in your packet that sort of summarizes where we are. Um, the uh, I guess I would guess that the thing that you're most concerned about is how are we going to let people know about the new winter parking ban. As you'll recall, last year we used a um, modified version of this. This year, I think we're going with the um, event-based uh, winter parking ban. Uh, lights, uh, we have the lights. We have everything for the lights to be installed, the flashing blue lights that are pretty common, becoming more and more common in cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth, um, except we don't have the brackets. The company that sends us this is in Texas, and it, I guess they had a hurricane or something down there, and there's a lot of demand for this. So we, we have backup plans in case the brackets don't come in in time. We have everything else we need except for these brackets. The lights are available. Everything else is available. Um, so come December 1, we anticipate we should be okay, but we have a backup plan in case it doesn't arrive in time. We will put, um, you know, we tr we'll try to have these flashing lights at pivotal points in the town. Uh, the, the main one will be at the center of town. Uh, there will also be, uh, uh, if all the logistics work out, at various locations at the entrances to town. For instance, um, at Atkins, at Pomeroy, at the bottom of Amity and University Drive, um, on College Street, uh, at Gatehouse Lane, um, on Main Street at Southeast Street, up by Cushman, and then the Pine Meadow intersection. Those are the Space, those are spots that we have identified where we control the, um, the light so we can install it and take, take the electricity. The one where we don't have access is 
on uh, Route 9 near University Drive. We don't own that traffic signal, so we won't be able to put one there. We'll put one up uh, closer to Amherst College. Uh, in terms of rolling out um, the PR, we're, we'll, we're going to do the, similar to what we did with the uh, downtown parking um, notification. We'll do a lot of PR. We'll, put, we'll ask the Gazette to put something in, not this week, but next week. Um, we'll send out a email um, to people who already hold permits because they're the ones who are probably going to be most affected. And then right after December 1, we're going to have people drive around on cold nights at 4 a.m. or something and put um, notices on cars that are parked on the street and say, if, this had been, if there had been a snowstorm, you would have been uh, told not, you, you would, this would have been a violation. So just sort of a courtesy notice to people who are habitually park on the street so they get the message early on without repercussions. Um, and there'll be a phone number people can call and all that kind of stuff. And, the, and on every flashing light, there'll be a phone number. The, um, and and so, that, so that's sort of the, the rollout plan. Uh, so we're going to be doing it through regular media, through media, through social media, through our website, um, and then through uh, email and mail to people who are receive, already received permits. And then we're going to be sort of affirmatively going out and putting caution notices on people's cars uh, at night on early on in the process. Questions for Mr. Bachman regarding this? Yes. So when, so we originally, we, we talked about this before we had a downtown parking working group, but then we talked about it again when we had a downtown parking working group. So what's their role here? Have they seen this material for the, associated with the implementation? Do they like continue to give us, I mean, will they hear, because they have business owners, for example, mm -hmm. they'll continue to have feedback. Will they pass that along to you or like, how do you? see their role associated with well, this we're particular we're in implementation piece. now, so it's my job to implement the policies of the select board. And that's how, uh, I mean, downtown parking working group, have, have they've already recommended previously, last year right. they recommended something. And then you voted, I think you voted this one as, you recommended this one as well, so. So should we just copy them on it after we sure. say, we got it and we understand it? And and then that's the right time to tell them rather than that we're looking for feedback from them before Feed it came to us because like you said we're at the implementation phase. Right. Yeah, you've already voted to do this. So now okay. it's just a matter of doing it. And you had mentioned if I could follow up. So you had mentioned at our previous meeting when we were talking about the rollout which you had given us the materials for which I think which I appreciated associated with all the other parking changes we're doing. We're doing a lot of changes. Yep. Um, and you had indicated that you'd gotten emails about that. So I guess I'm wondering if it's been made clear, and I know downtown parking working groups had some changeover with its membership, et cetera, and we're looking for additional business owners, et cetera, to serve on that. But if it could be clear to them, since they are a fairly new committee, that they're, if they get feedback, it should go to you. Not that it should come necessarily back to here per se or sit with them in some fashion, but it should go to you just like those people who are already writing to you individually. Sure. sure. And maybe we should tell them that at okay. some point in you the can process. Do that. Just so it's clear what their role is. Yeah, I would, I would suggest it's likely they might, if people know members of the working group, they're likely to give them feedback relative to the change in, in the uh, winter parking, so. No problem. Yeah, so then they it's make sure they know that you welcome. Sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> you need more email. Right. Any other questions or comments or, yes? Well, just, um, this is sort of a communication thing. The downtown parking working group met as recently as um, Friday morning and the last three agendas we've asked um, for an update on the status of the winter parking ban program and nothing was available or known or didn't have anything. So I was really pleased to see this in my packet this weekend, but um, I haven't done it yet, but I wanted to go and find the electronic version of this and as a courtesy send it to the downtown parking working group members because they have not had this information and they have been wanting it. Just even though it's implementation, they're quite curious about where we are in the process and what's happening. Yeah, they never asked me. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've been asking uh, just the disconnect between some of the staff and 
we didn't know that, yeah. yeah. So it's good. I think they'll be happy to see there is an update because they were like, um, our, and I showed this to our staff person, Mr. Malloy, today. So I was like, oh, great. So I'll get the word out on my end. Right. So I think the, the one thing I'll mention just to sort of put a frame around this mm -hmm. is yeah. that in the past, our parking policy during the winter months was to not allow overnight parking at all. Right. And now we allow it unless we have an emergency. Yeah. So we, it's a much more flexible policy in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. But mm -hmm. people need to be aware that there will be times yeah. when we have a snow emergency, yeah. as it were, and we try to notify as best we can the public about that emergency, and then they yeah. try not to park yeah. on the streets so mm -hmm. that the plows can do their yeah. work. But it does afford a greater flexibility for folks uh, to park during winter, much like they do the other months of the year. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure to. But someone's going to come in town one day and go, why is that blue light flashing? Right. <laughs> There'll be a phone number on the yeah, light no, they get that. Call. <laughs> right. Hopefully they'll get right. that answer. Mm -hmm. Ms. Burr, did you have another thing you want to add? Just, I, I think what I said earlier and then combined with what Ms. Greer said, just said that that's why it's a good idea to let Downtown Parking Working Group know where they stand in this process is that now they pass information to you and that rather than asking their staff support for a report that was never going to come to them um, that they need to know like they make a recommendation select board decides and then like they move on to the next thing right. as opposed to unless right. we ask them to gather right. more we're data done. with exactly. staff we're done with the blue light thing yeah. all right anything else on the winter parking no nope. nope. that's what i have okay Fantastic. So next on our agenda is the cultural district signage update, which I think plays into Ms. LaCour as well. But if you want to sort of introduce this to us yes. and so the, us through a little bit of it. The town adopted, or Ms. LaCour can do this, but adopted a um, cultural district, and we're pleased to have that. You can give it all to Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, give them all to him. Yeah, we just we give them pass them around. Pass them around. <clears throat> and one of the requirements under the regulations of the law from the state is that we install four very specific cultural district signs that mm -hmm. um, have been purchased and have been sitting in the basement of the the bid <laughs> and um, finding locations for them has been a challenge and this um, report can talk about locations they've done a really good job of trying to find mm -hmm. locations that are significant at the entrances to the district yeah. um, but are not sort of in your face great uh, thank you, Mr. Balkerman. So I, sorry, my apologies for the late notice on this map. Um, as you're aware, I had a lot of things on your agenda tonight. Uh, but this is uh, the locations that we have more or less settled on. Um, they're proposed because we now still have to go through um, various permitting processes for them. But, um, and I also, I brought, just to sort of orient you, the map of our cultural district, a little bigger, so you could get a little better handle um, the red boundary is our Amherst Center Cultural District so what we are trying to do is more or less get these at key entry points into the district um, these are not directional but they're informational to so sort of let you know you've arrived at, at, at an area uh, as Mr. Bachman said I, I meant to bring you the mock-up of the sign as well but all the state signs are exactly the same you've probably seen them in, in numerous towns this. Yeah, that's it, exactly. Um, so three of the locations are private property. One is public property. That's the one on the north end that we are proposing for realignment park. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that, that uh, northernmost sort of entry point, if you will, to the cultural district. Um, so we have all the applications uh, required. It's five different bodies that we need to go to. <laughs> Um, so we're going to work our way through that in the next few months. And uh, this one that I, I did give you the image for would be the one that ult would ultimately come back to you because it is in the public way. Uh, but my understanding is that um, this little realignment park is also under the jurisdiction of Public Art Commission. So we will go to them for that one uh, and then all the other bodies and try to get all our ducks in a row and come back to you. So that's where our cultural district signs stand. So I'm happy to answer any questions or provide more information Thank if I can. You. Ms. Brewer? Okay, I've lived here 20 years. I've never heard anyone call it the Brody Block. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. So you're going to have to help us is. out there. Uh, collective copies. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the same question. Never going to. It's Brody Block. Sorry. No one looks up anymore. 
Steve Brody will be assuming it's like, to know that. <laughs> that's even assuming it's in the front of the building, so, which um, some are and some No, are. it would literally be... So no, I'm saying the oh. name Brody. Brody. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? Uh, I don't I'm drawing a blank it's if it, it says Brody <laughs> up there, but I'm sorry. That's what I've always known it as, so... I should have said the collective copies yeah. building. Then we all would have known what you meant. <laughs> yeah, so. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. And so you're saying it would be on the south side. It's going to so be yeah. on that south side. So that's the only one. Um, so, you know, as you're driving north, you will see it off to your left. So it's a little awkward. All the others, you know, we tried to be on the sight lines. Um, but the, our only other option along there was the town common. Right. And so we were yeah. it seems like trying to choice. not do that. Um, but that would be our other option in that location. Thank you for that. I don't think we have any other section we need to take at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, if, before she goes to all these five different, four different other boards, <laughs> are you okay with these general locations for her to, to move forward? I mean, if there's objections to it, then it should yeah, be. Yeah, so certainly get back in touch with us, but we're going to start filing our paperwork. Yeah. So just to follow up a little, since we don't have like anything in our packet on this, right? These, pictures. these things. Just a picture. Yeah, a pretty there's picture. one. There it is. I knew it was in here someplace. Yeah. It's a pretty it's picture. With a, it is. It doesn't have a little. With the memo. It, yeah. It was on the back of one of. So the front side is part one. It's on the back there. Got it. I knew it was on the back of the <laughs> MGL. So this is. Th- they're pretty big. Yes. yes. They are big. And that was my question. And so, but just in terms of where they are, realignment park made the most sense to people thus far. I mean, that's the only one I find slightly questionable. Well, so originally we had um, been thinking up in Kendrick Park, Mm -hmm. farther up, Mm -hmm. but that's when we defined our boundaries through the Mass Cultural Commission, they pushed us back to the southern end of uh, Kendrick Park. So officially the cultural district doesn't start up there. Um, So this is, was our next best. We really wanted folks to sort of know that they've gotten to the boundary. So that was our our uh, thought, and trying to orient it, and, and we'll work with DPW and folks to. This is our best guess at this point, but we'll go out and have people hold it up, and but um, we this seemed to be the best location for most people seeing it, you know, as they're entering. It's cool. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so. Um, you know, looking in more detail at the one we have, and that's the only one we really have jurisdiction anyway, but because they are so big, I, I kind of get it that it has to be up high because we don't want to block sight lines. But this picture, this sort of, you know, mock-up has the, le- you know, trees with leaves down, and I'm just wondering when the when it leafs out if it will still be visible. And it's hard to know because, you know, sometimes that weighs the tree down more. Or I, I don't know if you would consider that. You probably have looked at this spot since well, it was, you know, for actually, a while. Well, actually, not as much because we, this was a spot that we were refining. Um, but it's not out of question. It will drop a little bit. Um, but, you know, those trees tend to have a higher arching. Yeah, um, it's just hard to tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell because that's when we took the picture. My apologies. So, but, so it shows it at seven feet, but it may come down a little, but then. Yeah, so some of that we may to, get. Too um, low. There are signage requirements, you know, there's requirements for all of that. Um, as I said, we haven't filed all the paperwork yet, but um, that's the ballpark. Okay. And we will come back to you when, when we've gotten all it. We'll, you'll, you'll see the final version. Right. That, that but it's just six no. feet and a half. I was or, just wondering, yeah, because yeah. it's three feet by two feet across. The I sign, mean, the the sign net, size is not changing. We literally yeah, own no, them, and the state but, gives no, you. But, I've got that. Um, the, the height may vary. Yep. Mr. Steinberg. So I have a question, I don't know if it's for you, Ms. LaCour, or if uh, it goes to Mr. Wald, who's my expert on the <laughs> subject, but um, one of the proposed locations is the new location proposed for Amherst Media, mm-hmm. and um, that is a part of the Dickinson Historic mm-hmm. District, and does this require approval of the local Historic District Commission? Yes, that's one of the commissions we'll be seeing. And we did um, all these property owners. We have permission. We have received permission. Um, so we've gone to Amherst Media. They are thrilled with the idea. It's it's not clear yet. At this point, it will be on a post. When they start building their building, it may be incorporated to the side of the building like the others. That's still not clear yet. But 
um, we, that's one of the commissions we would go in front of. Yeah. So it's plan. It's a historic district commission planning board design review. And um, that one is a historic district commission design review ZBA. They all require a special permit from ZBA. Yep. Um, cause they're non-conforming geographic, whatever, 8.4.1. <laughs> um, and then the others are design review. Well, Realignment Park is you guys, public Fair. art. The others are ZBA and design <coughs> review. Thank you. So since you're here, <laughs> you can swap which presentation materials you're bringing forward. I'm switching to. So this is kind of an FYI for now. For now, I believe yeah. so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And if it, you have an issue, bring it up now, but yeah. get another issue. Well, and it sounded like if we had a, a grave issue with it, then what, from what Mr. Brockman indicated, right. then tell her now right. before yeah. they right. go before all right. those bodies. Right. Right. But those general things are. And my habit typically is to come to you, make sure you're okay with the direction, mm -hmm. and then hold off on your decision until all the other boards have acted yeah. so you're aware of what right. the final decision yeah. is. That makes sense. So next on our agenda is the um, several topics under the business improvement district. And so looks like you have a few handouts for us. We had a few things in our packet under some of these things. But I failed to ask you to identify yourself with the microphone. So if you'd be so kind as to do that this time and, and also uh, your colleague as well. Uh, Sarah LaCour, one. Uh, resident, resident of Amherst two. and executive director of the Amherst Business Improvement District, also president of the Amherst Center Cultural District regarding that last item. Mm -hmm. Are there two handouts, Ms. LaCour? There's two. Yes, Good. there's a sure uh, typed packet and then also one with a photograph on top. And apologies for the, we, your packet would have been, you know, Reams it's a moment to, uh, well, it all needs to be uploaded, too, for yeah. the public to see. So give us a minute to get these passed around. Oh, more. I'm John Kuhn, Kuhn Little Architects, and also uh, a member of the Thank you. So, Mr. Brockman, do you want to introduce this at all, or do you want to just I think let them go? go? All right. So if you'd be so kind as to take us through some of what you're here for. Sure. Um, the bid has been working for few months to a year on a uh, proposed capital project that we would really like to provide to the community. One of the things that comes up frequently in our discussions and with others is uh, performance venue. And so amongst ourselves internally, we started talking about an uh, outdoor uh, three and a half season performance venue. We started looking at uh, some historic precedents for this. And that's the materials that I just gave you that um, you do not need to read that entire packet, but it's, it's for your information. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But we came across uh, drawings and references to Frederick Law Olmsted, who was the father of landscape architecture. And he did a plan for our town common in 1874, where he actually, uh, you'll see in the, in the second packet that Mr. Kuhn has provided, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's original drawing for the town common and uh, the a plan drawing, excuse me, and then a, a sketch showing the pro a proposed bandstand along the east side of the, about midway down uh, on the east side of the common. So uh, the business improvement district, when we got thinking about this, wanted to uh, we thought that location was ideal. The land form uh, is, is perfect for it. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted knew what he was doing. <laughs> and so we just wanted to provide you this background material tonight with some of that historical precedent. And then I'd like to give it to Mr. Kuhn to present to you where we got to with that. Thanks, Sarah. When we started <clears throat> talking about this, has to be a year ago. Um, we had a charrette at our office. I, Alyssa may have been there. I know Jim's been to them before. We, we do these, um, we call them charrettes. We take a, 
a problem that might be out there and we uh, either divide up in teams or individually in the office and we spend a couple of hours coming up with ideas and then at four o'clock or so we, we, we break and we invite people from whoever might be interested in this particular project to come in and have a little wine and cheese and we put everything up on the board and talk about them. And so we did that with, with the band shell. Um, with the notion that it would be in the location where Olmsted had originally located it. Um, and we had a really good turnout that day, and I think we must have had about a dozen different ideas pinned up, um, and a lot of different participation from different parts of the town. And from that charrette, uh, we began to develop an idea. We, we kind of heard what people said, and we took that to heart, and then we I think the one thing that we felt was important here is that the band shell shouldn't be an historic looking uh, structure. It shouldn't try to look like it was built at the same time as the Lord Jeff or, or Grace Church or any of the other buildings along that side of the common. And in fact, it, it, it should probably be a fairly contemporary structure so that it stands in contrast to the historic structures that sit behind it. So that was really sort of the impetus for our design. Um, it's an open structure. Uh, probably the biggest challenge there is the fact that um, this kind of structure is going to be exposed to a lot of wind and, and so it uh, structurally has to be a, a very uh, strong, uh, it has to be strong structurally, but it also has to be very open. So the idea that I think you have in your packet, it should should look like this, right? Mm -hmm. You have that, right? Okay. Was to create a base that's about 18 by 24. Um, the, it's essentially a roof with uh, two stanchions on either side and a base. And it's built out of uh, reinforced concrete and steel. It, for that, for the reason that I mentioned, it's got to be structurally very rigid. Um, at the same time, we didn't want it to be too hard edged, so we, we introduced a sort of soft curve on the, on the bottom side of it. The top of it would be a metal roof, a standing seam metal roof. It would just shed water very, very easily. Um, the, the sloping uh, ceiling projects the sound out towards the, towards the common. Um, and we, we, the stanchions that you see there are brick, so they would blend in some with the with the brick structures that are to the east side of the common. Uh, there would be some built-in lighting. Uh, it would be handicap accessible. We do that mainly with grading, not with adding a ramp, but actually regrading that section of the of the common so that you could walk to the rear without um, having any steps. So our goal was to create something very simple, very contemporary. Um, it does. It is in a spot in the common that would require uh, rearranging some of the events that happen there because the, uh, the taste and the fair are used to having the, the music up in the northwest corner and this would, this would require uh, some rearrangement of the, the, the traffic flow and the way those events are held. But we feel like it would be um, an addition to the, the town that would be um, well used and very appropriate. Um, we have done some um, estimating on the cost of this structure. We had a local contractor, uh, Tiagno Construction, take a look at it and the estimate was uh, about $200,000. So um, before we really get down to trying to raise the money for it and going through the approval process, which would be similar to I think the cultural district, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. three or four boards that we would have to uh, meet with, we thought it appropriate to visit with you first and show you what we're up to and see what your thoughts were. Thank you. Questions or comments at this point? Since I got called out by name, <laughs> I thought I would make it clear that I didn't choose this one. <laughs> and there were a lot of really interesting ideas for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, there was really creative stuff going on with, uh, 
you know, different types of fabric, different types of structure, how big of a structure, how adaptable of a structure in terms of all the different uses people could think of for it. Would it be multi-level? Would it be single level? I mean, it's a, it was a lot to sort through for you guys to come to this point. I, I, I will go ahead and say it, it looks similar to the one that I identified as a circa 1970 bus stop on the UMass campus. And I know you remember me saying that, so your not, feelings are not hurt. Um, but I can appreciate the simplicity of it and, and what you're trying to accomplish there to not, and as you said, both at the shred and here, not trying to make it look in you know, some historic gazebo sort of thing that somehow magically transports people back to whenever, but, um, but something that, that's more current and yet in some ways doesn't really stand out, which is, which is an interesting approach to take to it rather than saying, oh, look, there's that structure over there. It's really, in many ways, more subtle than that. So thank you for that. And then there's a sidewalk that connects, because there is no sidewalk on that side of the common. And so the sidewalk just basically takes people out to the road is the idea so that when they were moving equipment in they would have a hard surface to move it in and the main traffic to it could come from behind I'm just trying to understand that little piece of it yeah so when you roll all your little amps or whatever along there just to add uh, the location here there is a uh, power uh, there's a utility box near here and also a curb cut so we have talked with DPW, and that power, that utility box, would be incorporated into this structure. So uh, there would no be, be no need for that freestanding utility box that would be um, put into this. So we would work with DPW on that as well, and then that curb cut again would be the the access in to that. Mr. Steinberg. So I have several questions. Uh, in the drawing that looks like this, Mr. Kuhn, uh, there's a series of circular uh, things. I don't know what else to call them because that's the problem I'm having is what are they? I think those trees. are trees. They're trees. Tree, trees and shrubs. And that, that's not set in stone. That was one of the things we've gone back and forth on, and this may come through if we, if we get to you know, design review and, and some of the boards, is um, is it is it open in the back so you can see through it? Or is there some kind of vegetation backdrop? Um, is there vegetation? That, that's just sort of a thought for some trees and shrubs. But that's something that we're still sort of fine tuning. Um, but that, that's come up here. You know, would it be nice to have not see through it? Or would it be nice for people at the Lord Jeff and whatnot to see into it? Um, I think that was a proposal for trees, but not, that's not set in stone. <laughs> So the second question that I have, thank you, is um, what was the reason for um, the amount of distance between Boltwood Avenue and the bandstand? It's not, could have been put right on, uh, very or very close to Boltwood, but it's really being pushed into the common some. Uh, I'm sorry, we were trying to get past the tree line out into the common from the tree line. If it's back against the road, you wouldn't see it from the existing tree row? Unless you had moved, I mean, if you moved it a little bit further north, given the existing tree line, there would be some ability to press it in a little bit closer without affecting its utility for its intended purpose. So, uh, you know, what are the pros and cons of getting it closer and taking up less space into the common versus uh, getting that historic location? Uh, I think what Sarah mentioned is that it's in line with the trees, and we felt that was the right spot to that gave us enough room uh, between the curb line and the backside to do whatever grading is necessary for um, accessibility. Um, and we felt it would have a, more of a presence in the common if it was pushed back too much further. Um, I think it would start to feel separated from the common and it would start to fall be behind that line of trees. Um, I would say that one, one approach here, uh, and it's often helpful when you're looking at something like this is to at some point put stakes in the ground out there and, 
and mm -hmm. have everybody take a look and say, hey, let's move it three feet to the north. And, and it's, it's flexible at this point, relatively speaking. It doesn't have to be in that exact location, but there was a reason for why we showed it where it is. Um, I'm thinking of some of the common events that occur on the um, common, uh, the Rotary uh, Town Fair, the uh, Taste of Amherst, uh, the Big Brothers Big Sisters Art Fair. I mean, have you given thought to whether the location impinges upon their use or enhances their use for those events? We have talked to those organizations, and I think the common idea is that it enhances. And yes, it, it, it's a change in, in some of their, as uh, Mr. Keene previous, you know, circulation patterns, um, but it actually opens up the, the length of the common for your activity a little bit better. Uh, the taste where they put their stage sort of blocks that event from the rest of downtown. You can't actually see what's happening. And this way it sort of opens it up uh, lengthwise. So, you know, our, our feeling is that, yes, it will be a change and, and they'll have to work around it. Um, if you notice, one of the pieces in the, the package, the 1991 package, is a drawing. The Rotary Club, I believe in 1991, mm -hmm. proposed uh, Banson in this general vicinity uh, as well. So um, our, our feeling is that it would actually really improve some of these events, but it, it'll have to be worked around in the first year or so. Okay. I guess I've just... Um Two more, and they're, they're all fairly quick. Um, it's fairly close, you know, you know so it's along the tree line, but it looks fairly close to the tree as it's drawn, one tree as it's drawn. And uh, uh, have you or do you intend to talk to the tree warden uh, at an appropriate point in time for input about that? Yes. <laughs> and, yes, we will. And we have talked down. I believe they're <coughs> already proposing to put in other trees. So we'll be working with them on where, what the trees are doing. I think you're also seeing some shadows mm -hmm. from the way yes, the yes, uh, yes, aerial yes, photography yes, was shadow. taken. So it's not quite as close to tree that tree as it, as it might appear. Yeah, no, I, I sort of gathering that, but I don't know how close and in the um, interference of the construction with trees and... Uh, mm -hmm. I think we, we have Mr. Snow for a purpose, and so that's why I asked that. And so the last thing, I just as a general comment, and the, I'm not going to try and render my own opinion on it. You know, this whole thing about having a very modern look versus having an historic look is something that will have some discussion in town. People who have been um, unhappy with some of the new construction that they feel is not... Uh, maintained aside from size just in physical appearance the historic appearance of our town our common is the one place that really has probably the most historic um, tradition to it and um, I'll be very curious to get hear how the design review board deals with that issue and what kinds of comments come before them Well, yeah, those are uh, just one tiny question. I guess my rec recollection or assumption from some of the conversations was also that by pulling it forward and putting a sidewalk, you'd allow people who are performing to access the site effectively. Otherwise, they'd be walking off the curb onto there, and there's, you know, they're not going to walk in the front of the stage when things are going on. Is that more or less correct? Yes, it gives us a lot more flexibility for the, for different types of events right. to, to happen. Like you could do theater or music or right, and and the words. way Mr. Kuhn has designed it, if you look in the front. There's also possibilities to, you know, add additional staging to create like right. a bigger, bigger sort of theater stage. Um, so I'll let him speak to it. But. No, you covered it. Did you have another one? Oh, yeah, I mean, and then just, you know, in, in general, I guess we don't want to get too far into the weeds here because, you know, everyone in Amherst likes to be a designer, an architect, an environmental engineer, and a planner, and we're not trying to second guess you here. I think we're just supposed to give you conceptual approval for the siting as you go forward with the process. Um, as, as far as the questions about the modernity of the design, I, w I, was, I was happy to see a modern design chosen myself because I know there are several that were a little more historicizing, but, you know, we don't want Disneyland. And I think in, 
you know, one of the points of this, it's, uh, Ms. Kruger and I were laughing because we've seen this thing before. You know, one of the first things I learned when I joined the Historical Commission is that Kama is not a park. It was always used for all sorts of things. And it, it's in some sense a victim or a product of different mentalities. So it was this thing that was used for militias and typhoid filled ponds and hay scales and auctions and everything else. And then it became more park like in the late 19th century when Austin Dickinson and company tried to spruce it up and make it and gentrify it. But I mean, that itself is a historical, is a historical intervention. Uh, but it's been changed heavily over the years, so there's no reason it shouldn't change anymore. You know, my experience on Design Review Board, too, is that the Design Review, as, as Ms. LeCurin knows, and Mr. Kuhn knows well, is that they're not looking for things that match historically in the sense of similarity. They're looking for things that fit in terms of massing or spirit or materials and so forth. And so I, I wouldn't imagine that a modern design as such would have any problem for them and those who actually understand these things. Ms. Kruger. Um, so I'm going to make a couple comments on um, the site plan and the design, and I guess I'll exercise my privileges as, as a planner and a amateur artist. Uh, I'm going to start with what I like, and I like where it's located. I like the site plan. I know it's, you know, it's going to change a little bit, but I thought, you know, with the circular sidewalk, and I, I, I really like it moving to this location. Which, yeah, it's the historic location, but probably for a reason, because it probably works well there. So that's, that's good. Um, I like taking the utility box and, and moving it into the building, so whoever's using this or using the nearby area, will, the utilities and the electricity will be incorporated into this and gets rid of one of the boxes. I really like that it's open, and I think that's important. I think it's visually important to see through it, but I also think we don't want to create a closed structure where people are going to end up sleeping there overnight. I'm not going to go into more detail, but I think it has to have a transparency to it. Um, so I like that it's open. I very much like that it's contemporary. So what I don't like, I would like it to be contemporary. I care very much about how the lighting works and that it be easy to maintain over time, because we do a bad job with that. So it's to be really simple, easy to get to. This particular design, just, it doesn't do it for me, and what I don't like are those squared columns. There's a heaviness, it's sort of like a brutalism. So in that way, not because it's contemporary, but I don't have that lifting feeling or a lightness um, that I would like to see go with the transparency and the openness. I'm not sure about the roof. Um, I get the uh, acoustic you know, slant. I know nothing about acoustic design, but it has a little bit of the flying nun kind of look to me. And I think, I think going with some of the basic concepts, but maybe reworking it so it has more of a, of a lightness. But uh, clearly, as Mr. Kuhn said, it has to be durable, has to withstand weather, maybe less graffiti inviting than those little flats. You know, so. There are probably different materials and different ways to work with that. So I also am going to be curious about Design Review Board because they might have some comments. I, one question about the standing seam metal roof. Is, am I right that that's the material? Um, that can be really loud. Um, and obviously, if it's pouring rain, you're not going to have a, you know, a performance, but you're going to have something all of a sudden banging. I, I've lived in houses with standing seam roofs. Um, I don't know if I don't know if that works with what's around it in terms of reflecting some of the other materials and it, it has its own uh, kind of a look, a feel, a kind of industrial look to it and it, it's loud. So that's just my own personal reactions, I'm just telling you. Um, but I think there's a lot of things going for it in concept and I'm sure other people are going to take their shots at it and it'll get massaged. So I look forward to it coming back again. So. Go ahead. I could just respond to a couple of those things. Um, yeah, your comments about the, the, the vertical posts there are, at one point that was a solid pier. And uh, we felt that was too, too massive. And so the, what you see here is sort of a, an attempt to sort of lighten that up by, mm -hmm. almost, it's almost like a table with four legs now. You know, we, we looked at, at maybe doing it with steel or something like that. Um, the concern there was that that it might look a little top heavy that 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 roof might start to look like it was just uh, too too big to be mm -hmm. held up mm -hmm. even by 
fairly large steel beams, but it is something that we, we could consider. Um, the roof itself, the sides and the sort of the, the border that you see on the bottom of the, of the uh, the ceiling is also metal. So the idea was that the metal would yeah. wrap around onto mm -hmm. the roof. So yeah. if the roof was a different material, it would start to, it might start to get too many materials, I'm, I'm afraid. Anyway, that was the thinking behind. Some first reactions. So it's my turn, I guess. Yeah. Um, yes. So a couple of questions. Um, so one is I was noticing the, that you, you indicate if a little bit of electrical in, the, in those columns. Um, and I was just wondering if you consulted with the DPW about how much would be necessary, because if that, uh, and, and it may be that what is being sort of sketched here as the, as the initial sort of location of those is comparable to what already exists on the common or whether or not we should have something more substantial. In other words, if there are non-bandstand um, uses but needs for power, um, can it accommodate that? So I'm just sort of curious and want, wanting you to sort of check with the DPW about those kinds of things that they've experienced over time. The second thing would be um, uh, there's a soon to be started process for the north section of the common and sort of as it goes through uh, its design phases, you know, um, I presume there's going to be some interaction with regard to that and, and how its change will impact potentially uh, some choices relative to this structure um, and I think uh, the uh, the third thing I mentioned is that I, I am a little concerned it is it is essentially an upside down airplane wing and so it will <laughs> have at times essentially downward lift uh, instead of upward lift because it's the upside it's so it will not be sort of it's not a thing where it would you know rip itself apart but it's more likely to pre create downward pressure on the design of that so I just you know I assume it'll get engineered appropriately, but nonetheless, it looks as though it will catch some air and push down upon those columns. Um, you know, speaking of the columns, I was thinking in terms of, you know, again, there's a, a bit of red brick in that part of town, so perhaps red brick instead of the beige would be sort of matching in some like respects without brick. being too much so. I, that's just a particular comment, but but to that point, that what's immediately behind it is the Lord Jeffrey Amherst's Inn. Have you talked to? Amherst College or Lord Jeff about their thoughts and their concerns at all and sort of what you what you heard from them around that point uh, sure um, electrically yes we will consult with appropriate people to make sure that we have a probably some kind of sub panel there that would be appropriate to for the lighting that would be uh, integral to this the to the band shell but also any power needed for band equipment and that type of thing um, the upside down airplane, yes, this has, we have consulted with a structural engineer and, and uh, the interior of those uh, uh, brick piers is solid concrete. I mean this, and it's tied into the, the base is also a big concrete base. So you're right that the, the wind is really the, uh, the thing that we have to be most concerned with here. And uh, this should be red brick. It's just not reading yeah, that's what very, I thought. I very well. And we tried brick. white brick yeah. actually yeah. at one point. Yeah. But that seemed like it was trying too hard to, uh, mm -hmm. to be the backdrop uh, or tied into the Lord Jeff. So I think the, the appropriate brick color would be more the, the brick that you see at Amherst College. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of Amherst College, we did uh, we have spoken with them not on a formal uh, basis, but through um, members of the facilities, and uh, they love the idea, and Lord Jeff as well. It, you know, they they like really like the concept. So we have. And the utilities, I have spoken with Guilford um, about, as I said, moving them into the box, and we agreed that as we got further down the road, we would talk about the needs. Um, and regarding North Common, we plan to be as involved as possible in that process. And at this point, it's our understanding that things happening at North Common would be more plaza-like and gathering, but on a small scale, on a much more intimate scale. And so our feeling is that it won't necessarily, that, that these will enhance each other and, and be part of one sort of overall scheme for the common. Uh, so, you know, we, we look forward to seeing, you know, how that uh, project moves forward, but certainly we don't see these as, you know, we see it as more complementary. So going around again, because not only do we love to design things ourselves here, but 
we are going to get a lot of flack for putting anything on the common. I mean, that's just going to happen. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to think, oh, how dare you? And, you know, so we'd like to talk through a little bit before, before it actually happens. And to just add a couple of points to things everybody else has said, um, it would be important, I think, for the town manager to communicate that in the meantime, we can't plant any trees there because you know trees have gone up other places that surprised me because you know that's not my job i'm not the tree warden but let's not fill that spot in until we find this out for sure if that's actually going to happen um in terms of where it is we've been around in circles a little bit on this and it's not a hundred percent clear from the one photo but looking at this lovely old drawing from the historic i believe if it's where Olmstead was, it's in front of this, what is now a dormitory, was then a fraternity. It's not directly in front of the Lord Jeff. You can't necessarily tell that from the photo unless you're way better at interpreting photos than I am. But you might want to find a picture that's like your beautiful picture here that shows what's up here. So people can see what it's directly in front of, that it's in front of the dorm, which doesn't care, and as opposed to that it's in front of some aspect of the Lord Jeff. So just as you're making your rounds, talking to people, I think that would be helpful to them. Um, I did notice in the report also that I've noticed before that just in case people didn't think this was such a good idea, back in 1903, they pointed out that open air concerts on summer evenings are a potent attraction. So, hey, and that was before the internet, and we still do, thanks to the bid, have wonderful open air concerts. Um, I think it would be nice to be able to tell people that whatever these columns are, that they're going to be easy to clean of graffiti, because we expect some, not because we hope not, we certainly hope not, but we expect some. I also expect there'll be some climbing on this item, and obviously you've taken that into account. Um, and I wonder, because of this weird circumstance of putting something on the common, if it would make sense for the select board to have a brief letter that they can take around with them to these other bodies that say, we didn't say this is the thing, exactly this space right here, rather than leaving them to have to characterize it at each of the places, I wonder if we could sit down in a couple of sentences so is that we know we're gonna be the ones at the end of the process. We've had beginning talks about it, we have not said yay or nay to these things. We brought up a bunch of concerns, which we sure are sure the other people are going to. Here's what I fear. So I fear that one, people are going to make assumptions, not these two people, but other people are gonna make assumptions about what happened here tonight. And then nobody's gonna to come to Design Review Board and nobody's gonna to come to ZBA and then it's gonna come back here and then it's gonna get approved and everybody's gonna say, oh, I have no idea what happened. So, um, <laughs> I'm, just to give it a little more visibility, I wonder if it's worth just putting a few sentences out there that says this is where we are in the process and it's still got these other things to go through and we're not telling any of those other boards what to do. We're just saying we talked about a bunch of stuff. We, we could elaborate that or not, but to say that it's not a done deal from our standpoint because we know that they might need to make adjustments before it comes back to us. Well, I think that's called minutes. I mean, the simplest thing, <laughs> is, rather than making new work, the simplest thing is we put it in the minutes and have that recorded officially. And of course, we have the, the press here too, and I assume the press report accurately and in great detail and it's exciting. You don't seriously so. believe other bodies read our minutes, do you? No, but we can, I mean, we can take the copy of minutes and forward it to people rather than drafting a special proclamation or something. Um, along those lines, I, I, maybe we could, I mean, we, you know, we gave feedback from, you know, the minute to the large could we t tonight would we be willing to say as a as a board we approve having a built um, bandstand on the town common and we generally approve the um, location or this this part of the common being used when we might move forward or backward or over that we approve this general location we approve the you know not approve in voting but we are um, positive about having a built structure here and that we really look forward and encourage the other bodies who have specific roles to play in this approval to make suggestions and recommendations to us as this moves through all those other bodies that we welcome their input and feedback, but to let them know 
we, we're, you know, we're not divided. We might be, but we're not divided about whether this should happen or not. It's just the details. Oops. Oh, well. all kinds of hands went up. <laughs> so in essence, you are the client for this architectural uh, design. And so I think that having something in writing that says that, that mm -hmm. as they go forward, you know, who, who is the client in this case? And you're going to design review in all these different places. Um, the bid is going to be busy raising the money, so they're mm -hmm. a pivotal piece to this because they have to say yes also because mm -hmm. otherwise why would they raise any money if they don't like the like mm -hmm. it. So I think it's a partnership, but um, I think going out there so that when they go to the various boards, they say the select board's going to be okay with something. We don't know exactly if it's, but we need to get your input as we move through the mm -hmm. process. Well, I was just going to suggest that following up on my idea about using the minutes, a motion might be appropriate then, you know, because that way it's official. We're not writing a separate document and it's mm -hmm. recorded there and then yeah. it's on the record. So, so the to the effect of what Ms. 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 Kirby was proposing. But we might have an yeah. objection. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that I'll just throw out the other side of it, and that is that um, a lot of members of the public have not heard about this yet. And I am very much appreciative of the bid and uh, what you've done to create this concept and to bring it to the uh, to us and to bring it to the community and to um, offer to play the additional role that you've played, which is just invaluable. Um, but um, for us to take that bold a step is to say we approve of um, this construction of a construction of this nature at that location and we generally like the design seems to me that it um, has robbed um, the public in general of an opportunity to provide us input and um, I'm uncomfortable with that so so the board could have could adopt a process that you wanted you know, to have a public hearing or whatever you wanted to do if you chose to to get more public input there will be all these other public meetings when people will have input um but i think this is new terrain for us in sort of in some ways so how you want to manage it i think it's an important conversation for you to have Ms. Brewer. Reflecting back to my why I want a document, not just the minutes, <laughs> is to try and is to try and soften that a little because for for those very reasons and for what Mr. Steinberg said because I don't want to have a hearing at this point. I don't want to have invited everyone to come talk about this because there are some technical things that are going to happen other places that I can't control as and the select board can't control. And so if design review board says this or that or the other thing, then I want to know that. I appreciate that on the one hand you don't want to go to them in the first place if you don't have a general consensus but I want to know what they've said back before I ask the public I'm not going to bother the public with dragging them out to this if it's going to turn out that some little tweaks are going to be done that then we're arguing about nothing because that part's not actually getting it that's going to get addressed a different way so although you know it could be possible that it goes through exactly as you proposed things don't they have a little tweaks done to them so I would potentially like to see a public a specific come tell us what you think of this but I'd like to feel more solid on what this is before we did that rather than doing it now before they shop it out to those other groups that have different technical things they're concerned with in, in, in trying to be helpful on this point um, I'm wondering um, if we might um, with uh, whoever wants to work on this and Mr. Bachman come up with such a very simple statement document and not decide tonight but take that up at maybe the meeting of the fourth or whatever where we can actually see that language I wouldn't want to um, impede your progress as you go off to these other boards but I don't you know we're, we're in this like void week of the holiday and whatever and I think our next meeting is the fourth that with um, an article in the Gazette and whatever other kind of uh, messaging, it does alert the public that we're talking about it. We haven't said we've approved something. We said that for this board, we're, we're um, not objecting, but we're also wanting to hear from people, especially on the other relevant boards and committees. So um, we can postpone by two weeks. So I'd like to kind of see, I think 
to craft that statement on the fly here might be a little awkward to see that statement and then we can see and some of us may not be comfortable going that far and some of us might but I'd like to suggest we go as far as at our next meeting reviewing a couple of sentences reflecting our discussion that can be you know it's like your letter of reference that yes. you take around as you go to the other boards or we send to the other boards um, about this issue a willingness to entertain the idea of pursuing this a bit further than as opposed to a letter saying we absolutely hate the idea we don't want to you know yes. that's I don't think where any of us are at this point I think we're just we're curious about exploring it further so um, I'm certainly willing to work on something just brief mm -hmm. uh, if that's and then we can bring it back to have it we'll wordsmith it <laughs> at the meeting of the fourth. I was hoping the town manager would like to do that based on the Happy. minutes that he's writing for well, us. So <laughs> that would be really helpful. Um, and the other question I just wanted to ask you then in terms of practically speaking, are you on anybody else's agenda in the very near future that we're going to be slowing you down? We are not. We came to you first. Uh, it would be my understanding is technically it's design review and the historical commission is what we would be required to do. So we wanted to just stop here first and then move so forward with. But you're not scheduled there. Yet. We are not scheduled, no. Okay. And, and so with the holidays, so we're not so. holding you up. That's what we wanted to know. OK, fantastic. So I think that resolves item number one of your three. <laughs> um, so next, uh, I think the next two are actually kind of related. What's that? Oh, but he means under D. There's three. Oh, yes, yeah. under under the business improvement district, there are three yeah. items, and that's one of those three. Well, so the next two have to do with Triangle Street roundabout, and so if you would like to take us through that a little bit. Uh, okay. Um, oh, okay. So the grounds maintenance. We the the bid has, as you're probably aware, a beautification component of uh, what we do for downtown, and that includes uh, Marcus and our little golf cart, and um, flower plant plantings, and our pots and baskets, and tree lighting, and whatnot. And with uh, the new roundabout that's gone in, we saw an opportunity to provide additional aesthetic touches, plant material touches to downtown. The mums that were put in there recently were the bid. Uh, we paid for and installed those. And that got us thinking uh, about welcome signs that we, I know that's next on the agenda, but um, it got us thinking that perhaps it would be easiest for us to just sort of adopt the care and, and, and maintenance of that circle. So that's sort of what led to that. Um, I would give the caveat, just to be fully transparent, the bid actually has to renew in a year. So this would be for a year, <laughs> just so, just to be fully transparent. <laughs> so, just to, for agenda cir circumstances, the first thing we're talking about is the adoption of the roundabout grounds maintenance by the the bid, and then the second piece is an adoption, an approval of uh, wayfinding signs. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Um, we do have a motion on our motion sheet. They're both labeled 4D-3. The first one of those threes should be a two, actually, because that's the one that adopts, uh, affords them the adoption process for for doing the grounds maintenance. So I could make that motion because I'd like, like to add the acronym right after business improvement district. So since I apparently in the some people believe the only person who ever Googles things, um, I'm not, and so I'd like it to also say bid after business improvement district. Yeah, not a bid, that's not, mm, no. So, move to grant the town manager authority to enter into an agreement with the Amherst Business Improvement District, in parentheses BID, for maintenance of the Triangle Street roundabout grounds. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Yes, so just a question of uh, Ms. LaCour, uh, having now heard the motion that was offered, would it be more comfortable for you as executive director of the uh, bid to have a time frame stated um, so that this covers only a period in which you're um, able to guarantee? Uh, I think what uh, the town manager and I have talked about with other things, including uh, amendments to our current MOU, that it's 
I forget the exact language, but it, it, it's good until such time as the bid does not exist or some language. It'd be coterminous. Like that, yes. So if perchance, we don't expect it, but if the bid does not continue to exist, then grounds and maintenance would revert back to the town, but not a certain time. Um, okay, that's probably not necessary then in the motion, so that answers the question, thank you. And I appreciate very much the bid taking this on, and it already looks much nicer because <laughs> of the planned things you did, and so recognize that. Yes, thank you. Any, yes. Well, I just wanted to add that the planting work that the bid has been doing um, across from the, um, over by the Amity Street parking lot, the planters um, throughout the town, the hanging ones, the sidewalk ones, and now this have, have really, really added to um, the positive appearance of downtown. So I've, I have a lot of confidence in the bid in being able to keep this up um, and keeping it looking spiffy and keeping it watered. And um, I, I am glad you're taking it on because um, probably the best entity to do this for the town. Ms. Brewer. Along those lines, it was mentioned at agenda setting that we don't actually have a process for doing this. We have a couple of other places where people have adopted. We've got down at the sometimes referred to as the dog bone, the double roundabout down by Atkins. We had an organization come in that I volunteered to work on that. We have a little strip of land not on the property of the North Amherst Library, but across the street from that that has had um, a mixed sort of effect in terms of how that's actually being maintained. And so I appreciate what you said about that. We have every confidence that the bid is going to be able to do a great job with this. And it also reminds us that we don't really have a process <laughs> for doing this other times, but it works out really well to have it be in a relationship we already have with the bid. So right. any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right, so then next is the discussion about the approval of Triangle Street Roundabout Wayfinding Sign Locations. So if you wanted to introduce that so to us that as well. you've graciously agreed to let us have access to the circle, we have already have a proposal for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we have been working with the town on the signage and wayfinding. Uh, John is on the bid board, but he's also chair of our beautification and planning committee and has been the entire duration of the bid. So um, he's all very directly involved in all these pieces. We are proposing these Amherst downtown signs in as part of a, a landscape improvement to the circle within the roundabout. At this point, we these welcome signs are part of the theme, the system, the family, we've called it numerous things, that, the, that we, uh, the town and the working group got to with the most recent sign designer, or graphic designer, um, Seth Gregory. And so he's been working on with us to refine this for this location. And then our proposal is this low stone retaining wall, or not, not retaining wall so much, but uh, low stone wall. And then the signs would be two signs both on the Triangle Street access to and from the university, pretty much. One of the things we've learned through meeting with families at the university is their GPS, if they're coming from the east, shoots them straight up Triangle, and they don't know they were a quarter of a mile from downtown Amherst. So we'd like to catch them now as they're going around the roundabout. And so the proposal is for these two signs and this uh, landscape work. So just to be clear, that's essentially sort of a, a bit of a V-shape, sort of. If you were if you were on East Pleasant, you'd see essentially the back of a V, or sort of. No, more you'd, you'd only see the one. Of, well, from from East Pleasant, you'd actually probably not see them much at all. Right. That, exactly. So you'd see the back of them, and they'd be almost in a sort of the chevron two, shape. Two separate. No, two separate signs. Two separate, sort of almost back to back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you were coming up East Pleasant, from the Kendrick Place on your right. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't, you'd just be, you'd be seeing the sides of them. You wouldn't right. see much at all. If I could just add one, one more thought. Um, about four years ago, I think, when not long after the bid was formed, we uh, came up with the, the idea of adding welcome to downtown Amherst signs in four locations. This, somewhere in the Kendrick Park area was one. 
uh, down by the south end of the common on Route 9 was a second, near the Perry House was a third, and then yeah. uh, down one the out. Amherst Media, down right. Um, we had a design for that, uh, but we also knew that the town had been working on signage. So it, what made more sense was for us to slow the process down and therefore work with the town, uh, which both Sarah and I sat on the, on the committee that, uh, that worked with Seth Gregory on the development of this. So um, we hope that there, was, there will be three more signs eventually, but this was the, this was the first one. And seeing that the, the roundabout was put in and kind of a new place, it seems like this was the, the best place to start. Eventually, the whole sign program, I think, will come to the town and uh, it'll be more than just welcome signs. There'll be kiosks around. I, I don't know if you've been part of that process. I think you have. Just to follow up on that, we are looking at that. To, we, we, that's something we would add to our capital improvement plan in, t in terms of when we can fund it. Um, but we're getting quotes on that and getting moving that forward as well. To add, um, this is this would be the kind of first one of that family of signs. So it's kind of exciting to get um, the like prototype up, and then you know, of course, then there will be a hue and cry to do the rest. I wanted to ask you on the sort of mock-up of the stone planter wall. Is that going to be um, dry-laid field stone or cement with a, some kind of veneer facing? Is it, in other words, is this going to be real stone or, or is it going to be some other facsimile? What are we looking at? Our plan is real stone and uh, probably more like a, a dry-laid field stone. The theory was to have it look a little bit sort of old mill wall because this mm -hmm. sign it has a very industrial feel. Mm -hmm. So that sort of captures the essence of the town, the old mill walls. So this mock-up might be a little more formal than what we might go for, but um, that's the, the look we're It'll going, the feel real, we're going for. Real stone material yes. laid up by yes. a wall builder. And not yes, and we have not costed this out. looking yet. like, but something else. Okay, great. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say it was those four pieces of the circle that you go by at one of the big box stores. You go, boom, it's a boom, kit. boom. It's a kit, yeah. It's the Jersey barrier stone wall. We'll little edges. We already, have, we already have granite curbing, so it's, you know, it kind of matches with that, too. Right. I appreciate that the, in addition to making jokes, I did have an actual comment, which was I appreciate that the, um, the Mr. Mooring from DPW agreed that yes he discussed this with everybody and we knew and we had that memo in our packet that's really important because we sometimes aren't clear on that even though mm -hmm. people tell us they've gone and talked to people it's good to have that in our packet so that's great the other thing i'm just i just hope can somehow be reflected in these magical minutes that um mr bachman always writes for us is that these are very specifically i almost wanted to capitalize wayfinding the wayfinding signs that we've all agreed to as opposed to some generic kind of wayfinding signs like the ones we could relocate from sitting outside you know the corner near the high horse we're not doing that okay we, these are very specific kinds of signs that we all agreed to as opposed to some other crazy idea right, of they're part of the signs. approved wayfinding system exactly um but they're the ones we all we've all agreed are the ones they would look like this because we had the presentation or something like this. Wait, that color isn't exactly <laughs> the Pantones are on. So, um, when I look at the drawings, the signs look rather large. So I was wondering if you could tell us, first of all, is, um, what is the actual size and height that you you would propose, and um, second of all. What are the pros and cons that you see of placing it in the middle of the um, roundabout where it sort of interferes with the views of the flowers as opposed to putting it before um, on uh, the roundabout but visible to drivers as they come towards the roundabout, like on the side of the road? I think our feeling was that they have more impact as uh, for directional wayfinding in the uh, roundabout and also they are a little bit more like public art as well so it's um, enhancing the roundabout 
the plan was the flowers are supposed to be sort of tangent to the, the sign and the wall. Uh, they're spo you're supposed to just sort of see them around the base of the sign and the wall. Um, we did not really look at spots besides way back when we were looking, as Mr. King mentioned, on our welcome signs. But we really saw this as an opportunity to create sort of a, a landscaped visual area in that, in that circle. Um, the first part of the question. The, the size. Oh, the size, size excuse me. Um, proximate, they're, they're six feet, approximately six feet wide, again, as designed by the sign designer as part of the family, and about just under three feet uh, tall. And then uh, we're still, you know, we would look at that height. I think the wall was about 18 to 20 inches. And then the, the sign would come up above that. And we also, the, there's a tree proposed in the center. We're, we're working with DBW. There was a tree. The tree will be removed because it's dead. It, and then, it's so we're, it's gone. So we're working with them on, on perhaps another tree, uh, but that would be up higher and, and above. I'll add one comment, and that is that it might make sense to actually do a mock-up of this sign, just the, even a piece of plywood that we could mm -hmm. put up on a couple of two-by-fours out there to see scale. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always helpful to do that. The drawings are helpful, but seeing it actually out there would, would probably be something we'd, mm -hmm. we'd propose doing. And again, uh, we came to you first with this um, primarily because until a few minutes ago it was your... <laughs> we, we didn't have jurisdiction on it. The, um, we, we still, again, like the previous project, need to go to the various permitting bodies and whoever. Um, so we have not, that's why these are not formal dimensional drawings. We were just trying to you know, get an idea from you about the concept and where to go. So Mr. Buckland, if you could confirm, I believe you've spoken to the DPW director, uh, um, superintendent, regarding signage in, in the rotary being actually preferred because it prevents people from yeah, they're, they're dancing across in ways that aren't helpful for their negotiation of the roundabout. Correct. So there's no requirement to see through the roundabouts mm -hmm. and actually there's some beneficial aspect that you don't see through that you just are looking to the left instead of worrying about traffic coming mm -hmm. towards you. Okay. Mr. Wald. I mean, actually, the mock-up idea is very good. I know we had a case when there was a sign going up for First Church in the Dickinson District and putting up an actual piece of physical material help people to visualize what it'd be. Much better than, say, with you know, cell towers and a balloon and a string, which looks nothing like what actually goes up in place. Um, but also, I just want to underscore, you know, Ms. Kruger and I were part of this process that was involved in the designing of the wayfinding signs, and some of us have been involved for years, one way or another. But just with reference to the earlier idea that we have to have a plebiscite about everything that goes up in the public way, you know, this was a legitimate process. We did have a public hearing. The town is not voting on this. It's going up uh, because the town, established a duly appointed body, it studied, it brought in experts, it had a process, we voted on it. So, you know, this has legitimacy too. I'm sure people won't like these signs or like the location, but at some point we have to own our own authority. Ms. Brewer. I, I just want to clarify a little that although you, the bid is now, once you come up with the agreement with the town manager responsible for maintenance of the roundabout grounds, you don't actually own the ability to do something with the signage. So if yes, you I'm decide next you're, week you're, you don't like those signs anymore and you want to yank them out, <laughs> yes. you got to talk to the town manager about that. So just that's why we yes, broke correct. it into separate motions to make it clear that they're separate processes associated with separate things even though you have been absolutely involved in all, every step of this set of wayfinding signs. Cool. Um, I just thought of this, I'm sure you've talked about it, but is this sign going to be lit at night, you know, with a underneath projecting up? Because I could see some value to that, um, you know, start at like f from four o'clock until eight in the morning. And for, I know I have trouble, you know, when it's dark out, look, figuring out where I am and, and maybe this suggests some um, underneath lights or even solar powered lights um, so they usually those batteries usually fade out by midnight and so I, I have a small lit solar powered sign light but looking at this it's all very bright and easy to see I like that it's big because you can see it from far away um, trying to imagine it with snow there aren't going to be any flowers half the year there's going to be nothing and then it's most of this wall is going to disappear under a big mound of snow so i want something that you can see and i just wonder if you talked about lighting at all 
We did. Uh, we have not planned on it at this time, uh, but it, we've been going back and forth on it also in the wayfinding group, as we've talked about all the signs that there's been discussions of lighting. Um, we we're not planning to do that at this time, but that doesn't mean it can't happen later. I guess the other thing that follows on that is if they aren't lit, would the lighter colors be reflective? As you know, headlights come on to them, would they be potentially a little reflective, be a little more visible at that point? I mean, if you're not going to light it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're working with DPW on that. Okay. But it might be easier to do it as one package, that's all, to adding it. Further comment? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion relative to this. I move to approve installation of two wayfinding signs in the Triangle Street roundabout, the location of which to be approved by the town manager. Is there a second? I believe there was. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you, Thank everybody. You Appreciate sure all your help with everything tonight. We take Very a quick efficient. recess, Mr. Slaughter. We have to yes. The computer. So. Yes, we yeah, will take a short recess while uh, we get some technology in place. We're all back, so if we will uh, reconvene ourselves. Next on our agenda is the Regional School Assessment Method, an update, and uh, this is in preparation of, uh, we have a four towns meeting, I believe on the 2nd of December, where uh, these assessment methods will be sort of front and center, I guess, as it were. Um, so unless Mr. Bachman or Mr. Steinberg has any introductory remarks, Mr. I'll- Mr. Steinberg might, he's been doing it for years. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. Um, well, I think that most of you know the context to this, um, and uh, there is another meeting before, and that is uh, a final meeting of the working group that has been the <coughs> Fort Town working group. And uh, so uh, feedback from boards and committees in the four communities is being uh, sought in advance for that meeting, which is scheduled, I believe, for the 28th. Um, I, uh, I've reported on this previously. It has been um, a really um, tremendous process, and I think we really owe Mr. Rangano uh, a big thank you for having um, sort of been the leader of that process in the way that he has put them. Um, meetings together, put the agendas together, and um, immediately put out uh, the minutes and um, been in contact with all interested parties all throughout. It is a very difficult topic, um, and therefore part of the plan from the very um, first meetings was to use a consultant, and so we're now getting to the end of the consultant um, process and getting feedback on that to see if we are at a point where we can um, come up with a methodology that will have some lasting, um, uh, as that will last as opposed to one that we have to redo every year, which is getting to be uh, both uh, time consuming, tiring, whatever. And uh, so I, I think that's the basic introduction. Great. Thank you. And I was remiss in mentioning this, and, and I'm going to put Ms. Brewer on the spot because um, she's actually, as vice chair this month, getting to chair the meeting because I am an employee of the schools, and therefore I'm going to recuse myself from participating in this part of our meeting tonight. So Ms. Brewer will sort of be in charge of pointing fingers at who gets to talk next, as it were. Okay. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so she's you. Pointing at you. So. I'm going to do a condensed version of the presentation that the consultant made to the working group on November 7th. Um, quick overview, the working group has sort of narrowed it down to only statutory methods. So quick refresher, there's two types of assessment methods districts can use. That's statutory, which means the assessment starts with a minimum contribution that is calculated by the state, or alternative, which means you allocate it based on some other agreement that all four towns agree to. Um, so right now we are only looking at statutory methods and there's a, a numbering system. It'll be S1 through S10. We've narrowed it down to three, but S just stands for statutory. At one time we had 10 options, but we've eliminated some in between. So essentially the, the first step uh, that the consultant did 
uh, most recently was to do an evaluation of the seven or eight methods that we had left at the time. Um, he did that by using these criteria above, which are predictability, volatility, uh, recurring, timely, wealth, understandable, and I think independence is the one that's cut off. Um, so we didn't weight, the consultant didn't weight any of these uh, criteria. Basically, we just did a one through 10 ranking um, of each one to see how they related to each other uh, relatively. Um, so this narrowed it down to three options. These are the charts that we looked at. Um, it shows each criteria and how each method, you can see, I think there's actually 10 up there, um, how they did. So the overall, uh, based on this evaluation, was that S4, S1, and S10 are the final three assessment methods uh, that he narrowed it down to. A quick overview of each S4 is our current statutory method. If you were going to use statutory and use our current regional agreement to do uh, with the statutory method, um, that's what S4 would be. S1, um, and a real quick overview of that. So S4 would be you do the minimum contribution. Everything above that is allocated by a five-year rolling average of enrollment with a small percentage allocated by EQV, and that small percentage is capital. Um, S1 is the same as S4, except for you also break out transportation separately in S1. So you would break out a, a separate line item for transportation and allocate that by transportation miles, which would be a, a change from our current practice. And then S10 is a little different. Um, you start with your minimum contribution. The whole excess above and beyond your minimum contribution is allocated based on a 50-50 composite of a five-year rolling average of enrollment and median aggregate income. So one thing the group did early on was try to brainstorm new variables to potentially incorporate into the regional assessment method. And aggregate, median aggregate income was one of the variables that most members really liked. Um, the reason being is that it sort of accounted for some really high, un, high income earners in a town skewing the income upwards. This sort of looks at the middle. Um, so ultimately that got it down to three. And then the consultant did a sort of a deeper financial analysis of each of these three to get to his recommendation. Um, so this is just a quick overview of how each method allocates the assessment, how it's scored on the criteria, and then he, he picked the, the three up there. Um, so the first analysis that the consultant looked at from the financial perspective was a look back. So he looked at FY14 through FY17, so a span covering uh, four years. And he, he looked at if we were on the given an assessment method for those four years, what would the change have been for each town? So the takeaway that we had from this analysis is that under each of these three methods, the direction was the same, um, the scale was a little bit different, but essentially there, there wasn't a significant um, difference in these methods in terms of, you know, under this method, it, this town's assessment goes up and under this method it goes down. Um, you can see for Amherst, under all, four, all three methods, went up anywhere between 9.8 and 10.6 between the three methods over the four years. Um, Pelham went down between 24.2 and 29.5. Lever went down between 1.6 and 4.7, and Shootsbury went down, uh, or went up between 15.8 and 18.5. Um, so essentially the, the direction was the same looking back. Mountain Chair. Yes, please. So could you explain why some would go up and some would go down? Why, when you look back, what would be the mm -hmm. things that were moving? So a, a few things. So when we're on the statutory method, about 60-ish percent of the assessment is calculated by the minimum contribution, which is influenced by a lot of factors like income and EQV. Um, so if there was a major increase in EQV during that time span, that could increase your relative percentage um, and, or your relative assessment to the other three towns if they stayed relatively flat. Um, and probably the biggest component of this is enrollment. So for example, Pelham, which you see going down under all these methods, the main reason is, is that their enrollment's dropped off at the secondary level, and enrollment's probably the biggest factor in all three of these. Um, even under the statutory, the minimum contribution, there's an enrollment component. So um, those are probably the main ones. So the next thing we did is plot out all the methods, uh, you know, on a line graph. Um, I've grayed out all the ones except for the three that were the finalists, so the green one is S4, uh, which in, this is just a chart of Amherst, and this shows the assessment over from FY14 to FY20. Um, FY14 through FY18 would be sort of 
actuals because we have the actual data for that time span. FY19, FY20 would be based on assumptions. Uh, the red line is S1, and the dotted pink line, which is a little hard to see up there, is S10. So we have these for each of the four towns. Um, as rep as a representative of all four towns from the region, when I looked at this analysis, my perspective was what's in the middle for all four towns, because it seemed to me that would represent the best compromise, um, as opposed to if something's on the top end for one town, it means it's probably on the bottom end for another town. So. S10, you can see here, is in the middle. Um, so is S1 to some extent. Uh, this is Pelham. Same thing, you can see S10 is in the middle, and S1 is sort of in the middle, but near the bottom. Uh, here for Leverett, S10 is in the middle. And for uh, Shootsbury, S10 is in the middle. So long story short, the recommendation was S10. Um, we did one more financial analysis, which I'll show you, but uh, Based on this, it sort of represented the best compromise for all four towns. So this last analysis looks at the FY18 actual assessment and then plugs in the projected assessments under each method for 19 and 20. Uh, the blue section shows the dollar change and the green section shows the percentage change. So S1 is at the top. Um, Amherst, you can see, would go up 3.23% in that first year, which is a little problematic because the guidance is usually 2.5, so it, it's over that. Um, but also concerning is that Shootsbury would go up under this method, and sort of what prompted a lot of this conversation is Shootsbury feeling like they're paying more relative to their wealth um, than they should be, and so this probably wouldn't pass muster in Shootsbury. Uh, S4, which is the next one, um, is really problematic for Amherst. You can see it goes up 5.25% and about $814,000, so way over guidance. And again, this is the method that is in our current regional agreement and sort of what we've been saying historically has not worked well for the district. And then the last one is S10. Um, <coughs> in the first year for Amherst, it goes up 2.49%, which is within guidance. Um, the worst town hit here would be Pelham, which is, has a 3.36% increase. Um, Leverett goes up 0.35, and Shootsbury goes down 1.72%. And then if you go over one more year and look, Amherst goes up 2.41%, which is off, hopefully within guidance. We don't know yet. Um, Pelham goes down 0.89%, Leverett goes down 0.91, and Shrewsbury goes up 2.52. So of the three methods, this one seemed to be the most viable just from this perspective um, in that all four towns could uh, afford it. So again, S10 was the uh, recommendation based on sort of all those factors. Um, it was not the number one ranked from the criteria, but it was in the top three. Um, and I think some of the working group mem members appreciated that it wasn't the number one, that we didn't just use sort of the weighting system, or the, not the weighting system, but the evaluation system to do it, but we looked at all the factors. General sense from the working group, um, I would say Pelham, Amherst, and Shootsbury all seem to express um, some interest in pursuing S10 further. I think Leverett needed more time to look at it and go back to their boards and talk about it a little bit more prior to the um, to the meeting we had to, to do this. Leverett had, uh, Select Board I believe, had taken a vote to support S4. Um, again, that was prior to the recommendation, so they didn't have all the information at the time. So they did say at the last meeting that they would go back and talk about it more and come back to us on the 28th and see if, if they could support S10 as well. Any questions? I guess I should, uh, if I may, Please. put in some supplemental information. Just um, one is that um, it did start out because Leverett had taken that vote before they realized they sort of realized that they were jumping the gun by taking that vote. It focused some discussion on S four, um, and one of the things we need to recognize with S four is is that if you compare it for FY nineteen. The amount that is projected there against the amount that is in the finance committee guidelines, which is based upon the presentation the town manager made at the four boards meeting, um, it is, it is uh, $450,000 more for the Amherst assessment. And um, I think that there's a general understanding amongst the communities that they appreciate that that uh, is going to present. Um, a real crisis for us that they don't want to put us in, but then the only way to deal with um, S4's methodology 
is to substantially reduce the regional school budget, which then has an effect on trying to maintain the stability and quality of our regional schools. So that's one thing to, to know about S4. Um, another thing about uh, S4 that I just wanted to point out is, is that um, you know, this is the method that would have been um, the, the statutory method if there had been a failure to agree to a um, alternative method in any previous year. And um, one of the um, things that goes on with any statutory method is that there is some um, lack of uh, predictability, I um, the, think was the term that we were using in this. and. Uh, as a result, and I can explain a little bit of why that is, but um, the, the consequence was that over the past few years, we've sort of looked at it and said, well, it would be to Schutzberry's um, advantage if you're going to just measure it against uh, what we've otherwise agreed to in these intervening years to have gone to the, uh, what would be the straight statutory method without making any amendment. Um, this year, it's actually ch would, it would change by 19, and Leverett would be the um, town that would be in that point position, not Shutesbury. But it, it sort of emphasizes the point that um, these things shift, and that um, if you look historically back, um, Amherst would have um, had a lower assessment with the statutory method at one point than with the straight five-year rolling average of an enrollment. This is not something that has been in any way um, um, a constant. Um, and there's uh, therefore reason to believe that over time it will shift again, no matter what it is that we do. And that is one of the hard aspects of that because it's not so much whether there'll be a shift, but the size of the shift that we would need to be thinking about. And uh, the, uh, I, I think that some of the problem is, is that there are factors that get thrown into that calculation. One is what is known as EQV, which is essentially the um, property values, total of property values. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but that's basically what it is. And the other is the, um, average income and uh, because they are um, computed in the um, by the legislature and creating that formula to put wealth factors into um, and therefore what they saw as ability to pay into the formula but those are not um, factors that amongst four communities um, have a static they they tend to be shifting um, in relatively amongst the four communities, which is why this has been so historically complicated. Um, and uh, um, I think that, uh, you know, my conclusion um, has been for the reasons that Mr. Mangano stated that S10 seems to work out the best for all four communities, both looking backwards for period of uh, four years and looking ahead for a period of two years, um, which is as far as you can project. And but no matter which method we end up with, there's no assurance of where it's going to be five years from now or more. So I think that those were the additional comments I wanted to add. I'm looking to see if other people have comments. Ms. Kruger, in um, reviewing the materials over the weekend, um, I did look at the um, graphs, which are, were easier to see. It's, it's hard to see it in the PowerPoint, which you acknowledged. Um, and it did look pretty consistent that, you know, it's like these are the little rabbits running in the race or whatever, that S10 was kind of plopped in the middle of the graph for each community. I mean, and so. Um, sometimes in order to get something to work, it's, it's not just 
the formula, there's a political calculus as well. And um, it seems like the group, you know, understands that and going for that middle line and um, it seems like a case could be made to each of these communities, although in the short term it's going to be more beneficial and more detrimental. The different communities tried to adjust that factor of plus and minus as much as possible by trying to pick the best, you know, the best rabbit in the race. Um, so I thought it was, you know, a thoughtful and hopefully successful attempt because I totally get why you want something you don't have to redo every year. I got to be part of that committee like I think one year or maybe two, and that was enough for me <laughs> and um, did my time. But um, it's important to all the communities that we get this to work, and it's not easy to figure out. And I appreciate you, you know, working on it. And Mr. Steinberg has put up with it for many, many years, and probably dreams about it sometimes. I don't know. I don't know what I dream about, but uh, I'm hoping. I hopefully the cons having the consultant helped some of the logjam with some of this. And I hope. I hope we get there this year. I really do. Thank you. Um, I just think the you made a good point, and that I just want to clarify again is that um, S10 is not the best method for any town. Of all the methods we looked mm -hmm. at, we looked at mm -hmm. 10 methods. It's not even the second best. It's mm -hmm. again, it's in the middle um, of all the methods we looked at. So I think that's important to note that it's it's not favoring one town over another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. I'm going to ask you to back to the beginning, and that is when we're looking at the chart with the white blue and green. Mm -hmm. So I think, based on my years ago that I've repressed associated with the assessment method, um, that I understand the differences between 1, 4, and 10, but I'm not understanding the differences between what we're doing right now and 1 and 4 and 10. So what we're doing right now is so good question what we're doing right now is an alternative method right yep. okay so without you don't have to give me the yep. whole explanation what we're doing right now is not reflected here nope because we know that's not going to happen right that was a one year yep. and what we did two years ago was also isn't going to happen right. because it was a one-year method so the thing that i think it's important to not bother showing that since on the one hand we know it's never going to happen anyway mm -hmm. but it still is a little hard to compare three theoreticals versus yeah and so you're saying s4 is as mr steinberg pointed out the thing that we would be stuck with if we could not come to an agreement that say for example s10 is yeah. the way to go that's in our current regional agreement um s1 or s10 would require an um, uh, amendment to the regional agreement which we've done in each of the last two years to do sort of those temporary one-year methods but S1 or S10, if we were going to switch them permanently or as, you know, semi-permanently, um, would require an amendment to the regional agreement. So, I'm sorry, I'm still confused. So S10, assuming everybody thinks S10 is swell, mm -hmm. um, for all the reasons we've talked about, we would agree to that this year, but it would only be a one-year thing unless we agreed. Right, it would only permanently be... Permanently amend the regional right, agreement. Right, it would be all four towns agreed to amend the regional agreement. In the past, these past two years, we've said for FY17 only or for FY18 only when we've amended the regional agreement, we wouldn't do that. We would just change it to this new assessment method. And then going forward, you wouldn't need to do the four town vote every year. It would just be three out of four for the budget. But just to elaborate, it's not like we've only been doing this for two years. We've been doing this for years right, that we've been, been having to change it on a year by year basis. So while it's, you know, there are these sets of time mm -hmm. in terms of the kinds of things we've been doing in those sets of years. We have for several years been having to do something different. And what we're trying to look for now is something I'm, I'm trying to understand, not only to get us through this next year, mm -hmm. like we have been doing off and on for several years, not just two years. Mm -hmm. It's that we are also planning that if everyone agrees to this, we are also going to amend the regional agreement to reflect this so that we don't have to keep doing this right. over and over. And that we would use this for That's the five to seven years would be right. our aspirations. Yeah. Because it really doesn't matter, again, thinking back to my old way of looking at this, it really doesn't matter what the regional agreement says because the regional agreement is no longer something anyone's going to agree on. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> 
and we don't like statutory, and so therefore we have to come up with not only another one-year solution, but also hopefully a permanent solution that will then be in the regional agreement and then will count. No- but it would essentially be a new statutory from our, what our current okay. statutory method, it would be a new statutory method. But why is it then, I'm confused, because why is it then that we have had In the years that we chose to do what our regional agreement said, Mm -hmm. back before this became so contentious Mm -hmm. through this last series of times, before your time, um, when we agreed to do what the regional agreement said, we didn't have to keep voting that the regional agreement was different than the statutory method. Then we had to start saying, okay, we understand the thing we're doing isn't what our regional agreement is, and it's not what the statutory method is. Yeah, so, so I've the, lost track the of how many distinction, different things we have to vote on. We've had to do a lot of unanimous votes. Yes. Um, prior to FY17, the unanimous vote was to use the method in your regional agreement to allocate your entire assessment, which you have, if you don't use the statutory method and you use your regional agreement for all of your assessment, you still need four towns to approve that every year. Approve. Um, and then for 17 and 18, the four town vote was to actually amend the regional agreement. So it was a little bit different of a four town vote, but it's but still... So even if we change the regional agreement, will we not, in fact, have to continue to vote every year to do what the regional agreement says we're going to do? So, so this is like sort of the confusing piece of all this. Thank what, you. what we're proposing is going to a statutory method, and so the I never do a great job using my hands to explain this, but I'll try. Um, so the statutory method, all that means is that you start with a minimum contribution, and that you use your regional agreement to allocate everything else above and beyond that. So of our assess, total assessment that goes to the four towns, about 60% of that is calculated by the minimum contributions, and then everything else is by a regional agreement. So if we change the regional agreement to this other, to to what's an S10, which would make the excess allocated by a 50-50 of aggregate um, median income and enrollment, then that would be in our regional agreement going forward, and we would be on a statutory method, because that would show us how to allocate the excess. Okay, it would mean that because our, our regional agreement right now is too simple, to yes. be considered a statutory method? No, so th- really the regional agreement doesn't have anything to do with the statutory. The, re- the only piece that the regional agreement does is it tells you how to allocate the excess if you're on the statutory method. So that's confusing, so let me say it again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I, maybe Mr. Steinberg can explain it to me. I still don't get why what we're going to do to change the regional agreement be matters going forward. When the regional agreement was first passed, it was before there was the statute yes. that yep. um, is now the basis of these new calculations. Right. And so at that point in history, in, which back into the ni- early right. 1950s, when the five year rolling average of enrollment was created, You'd put that in your regional agreement, and then the regional agreement would be how you would allocate your assessments. That worked up until the time of Ed reform, uh, which I think was when uh, Weld was governor. 1993-ish. So, and uh, at that point in time, the legal landscape changed, and um, what actually happened initially under Ed Reform is that we were required to use the uh, regional or, or the statutory method, and uh, so there wasn't any mystery about it. We were just required to do it, mm-hmm. but um, it is as um, has been explained already that you had um, a portion that is the minimum contribution from each town, and then the excess was whatever was in your regional agreement, but that was what it was. Um, Then when the statute was changed to allow towns to do something different if they would unanimously, by all members, agree to it, um, we started getting into alternatives at various points in time actually for, uh, we went back to the five-year rolling average of enrollment, but we did it um, not instantly. There were a couple of years where we had interim steps so that we could ease the transition um, amongst the towns that then took us to using the five-year rolling average, which was done then as an alternative to the statutory method and had to be approved by all four towns. 
until more recently Shutesbury said, hey, wait a minute, and let's think about this. And um, that's what has then created this process that has, seems like it's been going on forever, but you know, if you go, depends upon what you define as forever. Um, so that is the uh, sequence of what has occurred here. And uh, does that make it better? Yeah, it does, because that helps explain why having it in the regional agreement, which at one point was not really enough to make it be the thing that will happen, if we change the regional agreement now to a method like this, that will be enough. Mm -hmm. And the way we will do that is at annual town meeting. Yeah, so the working group will make a recommendation um, to the school committee, and the school committee would have to vote that first. And if the school committee votes it, then it would go to each town meeting. But we would plan that this would be yeah. annual town yeah. meeting, 2018. Yeah, this spring. Thank you. Other questions, comments? I know this is so fascinating. When Mr. Steinberg and I used to talk about it before, I know your eyes just glazed over. But um, any other comments from Mr. Bachman? Okay, so we are understanding moving into the four towns meeting what that Mr. Steinberg can say, yep, this sounds well, great. Well, let me, uh, l l let me do a couple things. One is, is that at one point in time I had a proposal out there that we try and come up with a methodology that would um, get us to a point and that we agree amongst the four communities to an equal percentage increase um, each year to give predictability to all four communities and to the region itself because it would probably be based upon two and a half percent and it would give everybody something that they could really work with going forward for planning purposes. Um, I think that the, you know, that's, I brought that to the working group on several occasions um, and, it, and uh, it was hard to conceptually get to it because you needed to know where you would start first. Um, I've not really been pursuing that very strongly since then because uh, the longer you do that, the farther away you get from your original base point. And um, then eventually you're going to get to a, um, needing to re-examine yet again. And that's the, so the upside is you get a period of total predictability. The downside is, is that eventually you're going to get to a point where we're back where we are now. And I think that uh, given how torturous it has been, that's where we are. Um, there is a motion on your revised motion sheet um, that gives the th three ver different versions. The benefit of passing a motion such as this um, tonight is that when we go to the November 28th meeting of the working group, then um, I am able to report that I have come to the select board and the select board has passed this motion and uh, I can make a clear statement. Otherwise, um, I, I'm sort of in a uh, um, difficult position um, as to what to do um, when it comes to the meeting on the 28th and we haven't taken a position that affects what gets reported to the four towns meeting. I also understand, but don't know for sure, that the Finance Committee intends to also um, vote on a motion, but I don't. Um, at least that was their intent when I talked to them last. The Amherst Finance Committee? Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't, do they have another meeting between now and the 28th? I don't know. Uh, I think there was strong sentiment, but... Um, Ms. Kruger. I'm allegedly I'm calling on not, people. Not, you're not in the room. I'm not. Looking at you, so. <laughs> um, I am ready to make a motion if, if for the reasons stated. But I have a, a sort of a just a syntax question. An E on our revised motion sheet it says moved that, and all of our other motions say move to or move that, or move to recommend. So this one says moved, comma. Yeah, we don't usually say the select board does something within our own motion because that's why we're the body moving it. So it's moved. I, like I mean, I don't mind reading it as written, but is it is is it correct? I think it's just move to recommend. Okay. Or I move um, 
to recommend method S10 to the Regional Assessment Method Working Group as the assessment method that will best meet the needs of the regional schools, the four towns that are members of the region, and that is acceptable to Amherst. Second. Further discussion? Does that sound like it reads okay, yeah. Mr. Rangano? Yeah. Okay. The purpose is that yes. you can take it to the group. Any further discussion? Then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And is that four, unit four, yes, and one absent, so to speak. Okay. Thank you for explaining all of Thank that. You. Thank you for bringing that to us, Mr. Rangano. Thank you, Mr. Mangano. <laughs> we'll give uh, Mr. Bachman a moment to deal with the technology. <laughs> I believe on our on our uh, agenda, the next item, which is sent for art by law, it references right. oh, annual okay. town meeting article 281. And I know the meeting is long, but I don't <laughs> think it's that long. That I think it's either 28 or 21, but not 281, because that's. I'm, so, article two. Yeah, been twenty-eight. Yeah. Not sure. We'll. Not sure which article it was, but I don't think two hundred eighty-one is correct. I can almost guarantee that. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, I'll look before we get to the motion if I can. That would be okay, great. that would be great. Um, I don't know if Mr. Bachman wants to. Well, first he wants to. Shut down the, the computer. Bottom right, down a little bit. On the right-hand column, last last thing, that one right there. Uh, there we go. Yay! It's over. Success. Oh, came back. Oh, to it logged you off. Uh, click on the bottom right, actually. Just click and then. It should give you an icon on the lower right, just anywhere in the screen there. He has to X that box out. He may have to. Cancel. Actually, control okay. alt. I'll do it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. The super secret. Right. Anyway, so would you like to introduce the percent for art by law special legislation update for us? Yes. So town council, um, or not town council, legis uh, the House That's Legislative it. Council had some comments and some questions for the board. We sent those along to town council. Town council, which I sent to you and should be on your desk mm -hmm. tonight, had uh, some comments. There were specifically two questions, that, or three questions that were posed by house council, and uh, you know the, the answers, or recommended answers by town council are, are attached. Um, and town council had no other had agreed with all the other changes that were made by the House of yes. Representatives Council. It so. is Article 28, by the way. 28. Okay. Just take off the one. Okay. In our motion, in our agenda, motion. it says 281. <laughs> it like felt town, like that. <laughs> the town meeting's long, but it's not that long. <laughs> this spring, maybe, but <laughs> but it was just 28. Okay. So. Um, I mean, I can go through each one if you'd like me to. Um, yeah, if you would okay. just sort of. So the first, so in the marked up comp, uh, version that came back from the House of Representatives lawyer, um, they had asked three specific questions. One is, um, does the town want to borrow uh, for the art for a longer period of time or confirm that the towns would be um, for the same period of time as the building in uh, it's a policy question for you, but uh, town council recommends that it be uh, the same term as the borrowing for whatever for what's already permitted. The second question was, um, if the the uh, when you borrow money, there's some uh, interest that can be accrued, and should that go into the um, account? And, the, and typically, that's what we do. So, town council recommends that we continue with that um, policy now, um, and. 
and and then uh, it appears that the town is co contemplating the money in the fund rolling over in the fund from year to year. Is that correct? And that was the question is yes, that it is because the, what the bylaw allows is for us to put money into an account as opposed to putting it on a building. If it's a secondary building or a building that's not available to the public, we still comply with the bylaw, but the money would be set aside for a different installation someplace else. So the question I have is just given the in, in the marked up version of yep. of the um, the act that the legislature would act on, um, it includes those three changes as written, or does it need additional wording to okay. like the borrowing? I'm I'm not seeing as being specifically identified as to match the time limit, but maybe that's implied. Um, so I was just curious as if the if those suggested, if those questions that they posed um, needed to be incorporated into the text of, of this or were they already? Because the, the borrowing were, doesn't look to be the others do. Yeah. Uh, what, the way it was written was that these were, you know, when you do red line copy, there was que there questions on the side. And that's what, um, uh, those were the questions that were posed on the markup co copy. Just looking for my actual. Here we Mr. go. Mr. Slaughter. Just to clarify, so this is what the actual information, what, you know, the percent for our bylaw was super long, but yep. this was the part for the special that we actually spent for the special legislation based on what town council said. You passed this article, therefore this is what you are sending in for special legislation. It's just this little tiny section right here. And that's what we sent in because town council told us to. And then house council said, oh, let's make it way longer and put all these blue words in, in addition to asking these questions. But all these blue words are now also part of the special legislation. Am I understanding this correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it went from huge to small to medium size. <laughs> okay. The Goldilocks version. All right. Ms. Kruger. So um, two things. Um, one's a question and one's a comment. So if we were to alter the language, can, can we do that? Or does that mean going back to town meeting and a kind of housekeeping, if we, if we, not just interpretation, but if we decided we needed to change the language, would we go back? So that's a question and then I'd comment. That was a question that town council addressed in the section two that the town meeting pro, uh, approved. It says the general court may make clerical or editorial changes of form only to this bill unless the select board, unless the select board approves amendments to the bill before enactment by the general court. So whichever way you look at it, if you approve these changes, uh, they're either editorial by the House Council or they're approved uh, by you. You're the okay. only ones so who can approve changes. We, so we either. And then my, my other one is more to totally not related to that, but the option that we would have to decide about the interest, and you explained that it's been our practice to let the interest um, stay with the funds, so if we, you know, in one of the enterprise funds, and there's, so I can't remember. Um, does the percent for art provide any administrative fee back to the town for managing it, or other, you know, incidentals that go with this? I don't believe it does. So I am tempted to say, in this case, that the interest goes back to the general fund um, for managing this fund. It may be different than what we've done. Mm -hmm. before but I you know I, I don't know how other people feel but I think um, I'm thinking of doing that Mr. Wall I have to go back to the text you mean there I mean there was supposed to be provision for maintaining the art that's not what you're talking, I'm talking about. about administrative fee for you know the auditing the bookkeeping the answering these kind of questions going to running to town council when we need to all, all the things that we provide for free we had a discussion about Mr. Steinberg's looking at it. Maybe Mr. Watt's looking at it at the same time. We'll wait. <laughs> exactly. So, um, the other ones, I, you know, I could go with council recommendation, but that one I think is worth talking about a little bit. Because we don't have anything, sorry. Go ahead. We don't have anything else that's like this. I mean, we could say there's similarities to other things, but it's not the same as CPA and it's not the same. Sewer fund. Sewer, right. an enterprise, enterprise fund. Funds mm -hmm. Enterprise fund's definitely a different thing. 
CPA money, if it earns interest, it stays there, but that's a whole different statute that's a different thing. And they can spend money on administrative work, even though they often have not in the past. other than it being the more common approach. As town council mentions, do you have feelings about this? I, um, we have language for either way. I don't think it's gonna be that much money to begin with, because um, anything, any large project, it will go into a um, into the building itself, so. Right. Well, I think the, the question this begs, though, is the fact that you know if you have a particular so one of the components of the art fund is to maintain the art over time. Um, and if we don't maintain a certain balance through whatever mechanism we want, we could appropriate money to it, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't, it, we could essentially buy a bunch of art and never fund the maintenance, mm -hmm. which is problematic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one argument could be that at least accruing the interest for that those time periods when we haven't mm -hmm. ex exhausted the fund mm -hmm. helps to maintain the art right. as well. But at the same time, I, I fully appreciate there's some, you know, That's administrative work that goes on that's associated with this that, you know, this is a way to recoup a bit of that. So, let's go. Um, I think I remember that we said we would get into the sort of more fine-grained protocol for managing this, af you know, that, that supplements the more big picture um, special act and, and the article. And, you know, it could be that in that more fine-grained, you say if you spend, uh, if you have 100,000, then you only spend 75,000 on the piece itself because you have to dedicate X amount for the maintenance. And we just we're just not there. We said we'd get to that. We don't have that yet. Right. <laughs> Did you find something? Found something um, I don't know. There's. Go ahead, Andy. No, I've, I've on the definitive question of whether there was. Uh, Ability, um, provided for a management fee, um, I don't see anything to give us instruction on that. Uh, the um, is a provision that says, of course, that any money's appropriated to the public art fund for a particular municipal art project, which have not been spent within three years of the appropriation or which, or upon special approval by the select board within five years, mm -hmm. shall then become available for the purpose of the general public art needs of the town as recommended by the Public Art Commission. Uh, So that would come out of the general fund. It, this this uh, this sets up the, a special fund for this money to live in. Right now, we don't have a place right. to put this money other than the general fund. Right. So this would allow there to be funds for that. That's where the public art fund is called. And I think, and I guess the other thing to note is that it says uh, when it gets to the very specific thing that we're in there. And to authorize the general court to make clerical or editorial changes of form only to the bill unless the select board approves amendments to the bill before enactment by the general court and to authorize the select board to approve amendments which shall be within the scope of the general public objective of the petition. That's just state law, but I mean, the... Yeah, the, I'm looking at it, and I mean, it's, it's ambiguous, I suppose, but if you look at one, Roman 1 1.5, it talks about the Public Art Commission establishing budgets for all something, 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 operating and maintenance expenses 
and other reasonably contemplated items of expense in the acquisition, development, creation, implementation, and where applicable ongoing maintenance of such projects. It doesn't talk about a separate fund, but it again refers to maintenance. And then in Roman number two, it, this is maybe, I don't know if it's relevant, town staff shall provide administrative and technical support through various departments, including but not limited to finance, public works, and planning. So those are the two things I'm seeing that are closest to, but not talking about a separate fund as well, such. Well, the town meeting article did, did authorize creation of a special fund. I mean, it's, it's a yeah. separate maintenance yes. category. Yes, yeah, there isn't yeah. a separate. So the, the question is really, do you want the interest to accrue to the right. fund or not? And it's it, we have language for either way. It's really a, a judgment call for, for the select board. If we um, decided um, in what we're you know doing tonight or soon um, that the interest would go in the general fund, could there be a time in the future when it, you could appropriate from the general fund to the art fund? So you could town you could change. So would that require a town meeting to make that change? Like. And we, you know, we've been, <clears throat> we said we've, we've been tracking this and we have $15,000 in interest over the last X number of years and decided we wanted to allocate it back to the Arts Commission. So Do in a way it's reversible, but it's a town meeting vote. Correct. You have to require town meeting action. Okay. So I guess um, for me, I would like to recognize the amount of cost, ongoing cost to the town and sort of my fiduciary role here to say that I would like the interest to go into the general fund. Matt, it's not a motion. I'm just saying that. We'd need the, make sure I would read the right part of the language for the motion. How would you recommend doing that? Please substitute the following language. So we just say, This isn't exactly like That's as amended. Language, right. Well, why don't, why don't we talk about how other people feel so that we can decide if we're going to have to struggle with rewriting the motion? Because I might be the only one. Mr. Wall. I mean, it would be useful to think about it sort of from the other direction. That we produce public, we're talking about maintenance, right? It's about the interest of when, yeah. Right. And the proposal would be to use that for maintenance? You could use it for whatever no, or anything. No, 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 no. We don't want to make any assumptions. Not tied to maintenance. It's sure, keeping it totally open. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean sorry. I meant administrative, not maintenance. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think the concept would be that it, since it went to the general fund, it could support the other infrastructure that the town is providing the treasure collector's time, whatever. Right. Um, and be available for appropriation by town meeting to any account, not just mm -hmm. as opposed to it going strictly to public arts fund. Right. Is there kind of a, I mean, because it's mentioned by town council that the practice is normally to keep these things together. Typically, yeah. Is there, are there other cases where we don't do that or rationales for not doing it? Well, I talked to the treasurer collector and um, she said generally this is, it just sort of flows this way. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put the money in the account, the amount, the account, the funds stay with the account. Um, but again, it's discretionary. You right. can make a decision not to do that. Yeah. It would be accounted for differently then. Because I mean, if it's if putting it in the general fund is intended to make up for the costs that accrue to the town by supporting these things, well, then by supporting them directly, you're covering them too. So I don't know if that's a, a major difference. So again, I mean, we're talking about not real money yet no, at this no. point, and so that makes it all kind of awkward, but. Knowing that town meeting can take money from the general fund and could say, like they can for anything, and could say, this represents the money, the interest that's accrued. It isn't needed over here anymore. We could put it into that art fund, and we, town meeting, believe that's the critically important thing to do. I guess I like the sort of hands-on nature of that, of town meeting saying, yes, we're making a concrete decision to do that, rather than just the percent for art money kind of just being over here and it not supporting any of the infrastructure needs that are needed to make it actually work. And well, that's just all their money. It's like, well, lots of things go to the general fund as we talked about with trees and all other kinds of things. The money generally goes to the general fund. So although it's true that for a special thing like this, it often stays together, 
the vast majority of money of things that we get for fines, that we do for trees, whatever, all goes to the general fund, and then we parse it out. And you know, sometimes the budget book will talk about, well, because this money was collected for these purposes, I tend to think of it as belonging over here. But that's much that's fungible, so that you can make rational decisions. And I mean, it might be $15 for a little <laughs> while, in which case it's not really paying for anything. Right. But if town meeting wants to make the statement that it needs to be in the art fund, then they can choose to do that. At this point, there isn't any money there to do that with, and it may be that they decide in the future, no, it makes sense to justify it's actually taking this much time for these people to do this stuff, which is just why we charge money to the CDBG block grant. We're allowed to because it costs money to run that process. So I think I feel comfortable with that because town meeting can always decide to move the money if they choose to. Mr. Walter, Mr. Steinberg, anything else? I was just exploring the possibilities, you know, because I want to get a sense of what practice is. And it, I'm not sure it's quite analogous, but I understand why you make the analogy. And the, certainly a town meeting has been fairly free in appropriating money it thinks for what, for what it thinks is the worthy purpose. So I don't think they would deny public art funding that was needed to cover those costs if it came up at, the, at some point in the future. So I'm looking at, at the... Um I guess it would be blue line version mm -hmm. of what they sent us. And, and I'm, I still have a bit of an open question about their first question regarding uh, the line that's in there is further that the cost for public art projects funded by the public art fund shall be eligible for borrowing. Um, and they asked the question whether they're, um, whether we, it's in there just to confirm that it's eligible? That's, they put in assuming. That's our sentence. Right. We gave them that sentence. So right. that's why that one's not blue. That's one of the few black ones. Right. So then the second, but the question that, that the question that the, that uh, KP Law wrote back about was about providing longer term for borrowing. So that's one of the things that, yeah, actually that's in their question is, uh, and provide a longer term for borrowing, or is the town simply confirming that these will be eligible for borrowing? So right. I, I think, think that's the piece that's not explicit in the language that they've got, that we originally proposed, was whether it was or was not for the same term. And that's what we may need to add to a motion, is to make that explicitly mm -hmm. the same term. I think you want to answer all three questions mm -hmm. in your motion. I think you're right on that. Right, and then we could exclude the interest accrued. So the next sentence in that paragraph is any interest accrued shall be credited to and become part of the fund we could exclude that well it says to substitute in the interest earned on the fund shall be treated as general fund revenue of the town right that's a, sub that's a substitute language for that so I think it's going to be an interesting motion because on our motion sheet isn't like that at all mr. Yeah. Seinberg which gets to a question that I have um, what is the procedural reason with the um, legislature which is now in a uh, series where they're not in formal session anymore, uh, of feeling that we need to rush this to the point of doing it tonight as opposed to allowing some time to craft the right motion for our next, the first meeting in December. That, that's easy that, to that do. Occurred to me mm -hmm. too. We could, right. yeah. we uh, so I think that right. my inclination would be not to try mm -hmm. and craft a motion tonight because this is far too important and far too complex. The second thing I'll share with uh, all of you is that if it goes to the, if, if the money goes to the general fund with the thought that then money could be appropriated by town meeting to the um, art fund. Um, does it create a precedent of then making appropriations which could become subject to either other requests or requests to increase the amount since money from the general fund, once it's in the general fund, um, you're sort of creating a precedent in the process that's going to do something that may uh, get some un un unwanted consequences so in my vision that wouldn't really happen all the time it's just I'm just saying that is a possibility but I'm more kind of creating a precedent that where there's 
um, separate funds to be administered for special purposes, there's an administrative cost, and this is an opportunity to offset that to a very small degree. If at some point down the road, on, for whatever reason, out of there's still an opportunity to appropriate back, it could be out of you know tax money, whatever. So I'm just I just wanted to be clear that there was a mechanism. I'm not suggesting that every year you're going to take the interest and appropriate it back. I'm more concerned of, um, that I think the town's administrative cost should be offset. It's going to be a very small amount of money. I realize. Hopefully, it's a small amount of work for the staff, but uh, <laughs> don't know about that. Well, the hour, already hours in, lost. <laughs> right. So I wonder if we could. Well, a couple of things. One is, if we don't have yet consensus that the money, the interest should go, the interest, the little teeny interest, mm -hmm. should go in the general fund, then we're going to need two versions of this. But it looks like the other two issues we we will address the same way. So rather than tossing this all together, it appears that what we need is a new sheet that says, here are the exact words you are approving, and then our motion will not say, based on an email of 11 or 7 a.m., yeah. yeah. because that's, that, it, that doesn't work just because of the length and the complexity. And this. It was a, a good, good way to reference it, but right. for right now, to reference a new thing that you create sure that town council perhaps has yes, looked at again that said, these are the words I'm going to give them. Right. And, and, and it, this set or this set mm -hmm. when it right. comes to the interest going to the general fund. Or right. the, and these are, these are our two choices. So the way I'm reading the board is that it's, it's yes to questions one and three and then give you options for question two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We can think about it right. and debate right. it. And okay. When does the legislature go back in session? Or will they not go back in session until after the new if, year? If they're in formal session, sometimes these things just flow through on during informal sessions as long as no one objects. So this is a local a home rule petition. Right. Um, I'm not sure. You know, it depends on the clout that your representative has usually. Right. I just didn't know whether or not, I mean, I know we're not in a tremendous amount of pressure to do this, but at the same time, we don't want to let it languish too long either and or also get in a place where it will be six more months before they can even take it up. But I'm not as familiar with the legislative process, so. It, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, it's not my workload, but it sounds like it's going to be pretty straightforward right. for you to throw this together. It's right. just substituting yeah, in. You'll have it words. on your December 4th okay. agenda. And sure. then the other thing I'd like the, is the actual motion, no matter how it references, go look at that document dated such and such, that it also includes the annual town meeting article. So like maybe where it says, AKA percent for art bylaw, annual town meeting, 426.17. Again, just, we connected the dots on the, agenda but we didn't do it in the motion itself right. and I think that's important and I think out of um, despite what frustration it may cause us I think that we should copy the petitioners on the fact that we're planning to do yes. this. It's actually the art commission it wasn't petitioners. Right the art commission itself. So yes I, I, well, they were the petitioners, I emailed yeah, they Mr. Mr. Brody and um, Mr. Tabarge Renee about this mm -hmm. so they're aware of this yeah but just to let them know that, it, that to sure. look at the yeah. language on the fourth understood not that we're expecting them to come but that they should know what it is right thank you that was complicated <clears throat> right and well and, and and i was i wasn't sure whether or not we'd be able to get through that or not with given the subtlety of yeah mm -hmm. you know right. home rule petitions and whatnot so next, um, I'm almost thinking we should skip the debrief for a moment and do, we have an easement yes. and a consent calendar, which will take probably about two minutes total, yes. and then we can come back to uh, that. So if, if, if you guys, if the board mm -hmm. would feel obliged to that, uh, we could take up those two topics, I think, fairly quickly, and then we can have a more expansive thing and not be sort of mm -hmm. trying to remember to pack that in at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be inclined to look at the easement to Verizon uh, 740 Belchtown Road. So if Mr. Bachman, you want to frame this in any way. So this is for the cell tower on the landfill and you had previously given an easement or the town meeting had voted it and you executed an easement um, to Eversource and this allows, uh, this is a com compatible document uh, for Verizon that didn't get picked up at we should have done it at the same time but it didn't, we didn't so i move pursuant to the vote taken under article 31 of the april 28 annual town meeting Sorry. as can april 28 or april yes 
good year. She meant, wait, because that's, our town meeting was April 26th this past year. It's, it wasn't this past year. It was no. this it was past year, back. which is why I was wondering if we wanted a to year put the year in. A year would be useful. In. Yes, <laughs> yeah. a year would oh, be useful. Oh, details, details. Uh, uh, 2017, she says, but that's not, not right. That's not, yeah, that's not right. One of the dates is wrong. Yeah. Because I thought we started on the 26th. Yeah. yeah. Um. This goes back a bit because we originally authorized the manager previous to you being hired and to go into a long term agreement. So, can someone look up annual town meeting 26? We think it's 2016. Article 31. Let's see if it's Article Why don't 31. you do the consent calendar motion? <laughs> well, we're I have it in the, uh, I'll try and do that. Well, you so let's do, do that. It seems so simple <laughs> a moment ago, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so first off, oh, on the two things. 2014. Oh, okay. Wow. okay well. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was thinking okay. a Well, that explains a lot. So I move pursuant to the vote taken under Article 31 of the April 28, 2014 Annual Town Meeting as continued to grant to Verizon New England Incorporated an electric and communications easement in, on, and under a 15-foot wide portion of the town-owned property located at 740 Belcher Town Road for the purpose of serving the telecommunications tower and related equipment installed on a portion of the property by Verizon New England Incorporated pursuant to a lease agreement <coughs> with the town. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Yeah, where did you find that? Because I'm not understanding why it wasn't in this. Because it says right no, on the an front. As a certified copy of which is attached. So it must mm -hmm. be here. Not in this one. Yeah, not in this one. Oh. It's probably something I have. Uh, well, you have the special copy. Because yes, we do often see that with Ms. Burgess' yeah. signature at the bottom. So now we know for sure packet, so. that's what it is. That's why we're so confused. Okay. All right. Because when something says yeah, it, it's attached and it isn't, it's it, not. Yeah. I don't think it got attached to this version. Yeah. Unless it's in the back. No, nope, it doesn't it's seem not. to be. So, yes, our version did not. Okay. Any Thanks further discussion? For cleaning that up. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That's unanimous. And now the consent calendar. We move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for the November 20, 2017 agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Is everyone aware that we added a select board meeting via the consent calendar? Oh, did we? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Three. Surprise. Three. Well, that's actually worth, that's worth it's, mentioning. It says as the, the agenda for consent, and it's not on the agenda, so did we really add it or not? It, a select board meeting is not something we have to carry on our agenda. No, I know, but I, we didn't really add it because it says it's consent all under, calendar on the agenda, and it's not part of the agenda's <laughs> consent calendar, so even though it's on Good the motion, it, it doesn't really add it. You can take that reference. topic up. Why don't we just take it we'll, out? We'll yeah, take, take that out. topic up later since yeah, it's not on the agenda. It out, it's really I think that's not, a good point because really it okay. never got added. Yeah, yeah. It never really. So was. I will uh, delete three. I change, propose to change my motion if the seconder agrees to delete three and uh, present it and to make it as amended. Because. Yeah. All right, with seconder, it is. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right, we'll come back to the topic of December 11th later, <laughs> I think. But at this point, I think what we will do is ask Mr. Bachman, although it has my name attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about post-town meeting debrief. Sure, so uh, I'll give you a more formal um, memo next time. Generally, what happened based on town meeting, we have four general bylaws, uh, five general bylaws that were passed, um, and two zoning bylaws that were passed. The town clerk uh, puts those material, those actions together into a packet. She needs a report from the planning board before she, and she submits them all at once to the um, 
Attorney General's office, and the Attorney General has 60 days to approve them. So um, the uh, language will all be, I don't think they've gone out yet. Um, she tends to wait for the planning board to submit their, their report, um, their final report, and, and that sometimes takes a little bit of time, but we have 30 days to execute this. Um, so those are all the bylaw changes. Um, the, uh, there were two marijuana, on the general bylaws, there were two marijuana, the limitation in the use of marijuana in the public way is the shade tree um, bylaw, the uh, town meeting advisory committee bylaw, and then the zero energy for public buildings bylaw. And in the, in the zoning, there was the recreational marijuana and the footnotes that were both passed by town meeting. Um, on top of that, we had um, the bylaw or the um, action by town meeting to establish the regional school committee, which is in the hands of the town moderator to appoint. Um, the um, the chart, the the um, charter school language that, that we have to send off. Um, the the 100% renewable petition that we'll send off and the petition for end of life that we haven't sent off yet. Um, and then there's the North Amherst Library. Um, and we had a meeting today on that among staff to try and figure out exactly how we can sort of move that forward. Um, the, our, our shared procurement officer is working on um, a procedure for moving that because you, when you use chapter seven, of the general laws, which is what's required and which was included in, in the motion, um, there are certain steps you have to take. And he was already preparing this in anticipation of a different library project. So he has he will have those uh, to me by Wednesday. And there are certain steps you have to take in terms of, um, I didn't bring my notes on that, unfortunately, um, in terms of setting up um, um, the the RFP for the services, you have to decide if you're going to have an OPM for this project or not. If you're going to do it, you need to decide early. Um, so there's lots of different things. We had an extensive discussion about um, if this project um, is would be under a potential, assuming that the Attorney General passes or approves of the zero energy for public buildings um, bylaw, um, if this would qualify or not because the bylaw is written in such a way as to say um, any project over a million dollars, there's some debate about it. And when you look at the totality of the project that mm -hmm. was required by town meeting, it clearly will be over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. If you look at this bylaw and say, oh, it's just for the new footprint, um, then it might, it might not be over a million dollars. And how we look at that, because the, the bylaw states total project cost. Um, there are some broad implications on how we interpret this, so we have to have some dialogue on it because, you know, this, this, however we make decisions now will apply to future projects down the road. And, you know, for instance, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, suppose the DPW stays where it is and they do a renovation, they demolish everything except the four walls, does that suddenly mean a renovation? So it doesn't, you know, so there's, there's just, it's sort of a thing to think about and I think this will also inform if the um, if if the board would like to entertain the dialogue with um, the people who were the proponents of the en zero energy some ideas for uh, adjusting that bylaw to make it more workable. Um, because when, now that we're sort of using it, we're actually looking at it and saying, well, how does it apply to this or not? Does it or not? There are some really clear uh, um, problems with it, and it's actually interesting that we talked about the public art by law because that came back a couple times and there was a lot of work on it and we struggled with some of these words and consulted with council about well when do we say art's going to be in, you know who who makes that call exactly when and there were some real back and forth with the board and with members of the of the um, committee who understood the issue the challenge on like who makes the call if it's going to be over a million dollars or not it's a it's, you know you have to know that in advance when you're going out to bid so there's lots of things to, that were uh, working on on this, um, but I want to, you to know that that's not just we're not. It's just not lying, lying there doing nothing. We are taking action on it, trying to figure out how we move forward. What we will probably do in this case is say just alert the bidders that there are two potential bylaws that might apply to this project. We don't know the the public art and the um, zero energy, and 
just leave it out there, just put, pe put people on notice and see what comes back um, on, this project, on this project in particular. Um, I did have notes actually. So, um, so there's, when you go through, I, did, I do have my notes, I realized. Um, there are formal procedures. You have to, you have to take steps to include the, uh, ensure supplier diversity. Uh, you choose three finalists based on qualities, and then you open up the, um, you can negotiate the fees. Um, if the project is over $1.5 million and owner's project manager is required, um, if you're going to use the owner project manager, it has to be done at designer selection. Um, we anticipate that it will be about three to four weeks um, for advertising uh, and, uh, and then get responses back and given the, where we are in this um, time frame, I just asked the uniform procurement, the, um, our shared procurement officer, I said, well, give me your best guess on when we would be choosing a designer and he thought mid-February given the time where we are with the holidays and everything like that. Um, and then the question was, if, we, if it's going to be over 1.5 million, we have to use an OPM. There's a, a separate process for choosing that. Um, what does $50,000 buy us? The sense was uh, feasibility, a design, uh, maybe some rough schematics. You're not going to get anything that you could really bid from. Um, probably if the you know, board or petitioners or somebody wanted to move this forward, you could be looking for design money we would put this into the JCPC process along with everything else. And the, we'd ask the JCPC the Joint Capital Planning Committee to decide in terms of do you want to take, put more money into the project for design or not? Um, and that would be the, the next steps. So, um, but he's going to write up something for me by Wednesday. I'll, I can share that out with folks so you can, it's a, it's not easy, it's not simple, but uh, thank God we have somebody who has done this before and has worked for the state and doing it and knows what the rules are. So that's on the North Amherst Library and all the other ones as well. Cool. See my puzzled face over yep. here. And so um, that's important. So I'm, I just want to be a little clearer on some of the language and I think that, and, 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 and so I'd like the memo to try and do this, that, that he's writing to you that you will then share with us, which will become a public document at some point potentially, which is that when you, I'm not trying to catch you out, I'm trying to understand. <clears throat> when you talk about mid-February to choose a designer, you're talking about, I'm confused because we're talking at this point about putting something out through all this lengthy process um, to do something for $50,000 and we'll get those responses back and when you say choose a designer you're saying choosing you're calling the person who's going to do the work for $50,000 a designer or is that the next stage no that's that's this stage that's this so stage. you're calling the person who's going to do $50,000 worth of work okay, which right. as you indicated is lucky if it includes rough schematics given what we're asking for um, is what we would call a designer mm -hmm. And so if that happens in February to do the actual work, this is right, assuming we get any bids and you know you never know how things are gonna go. And then we get adequate ones based on the mm -hmm. criteria that we've provided. And then we would choose the designer to do that $50,000 worth of work. What is given February is kind of a long way from here. I'm trying to understand how we'll be able, I know, about the JCPC process for the long-term amount, but in terms of being able to inform annual town meeting, which I think was made pretty clear at fall town meeting, that they're gonna wanna be able to compare this in their heads, at least, if not on the JCPC report, as to how this fits in with everything else. I mean, I know we're gonna spend the 50, because that's what they told us to do, but knowing what that 50 is gonna, if we don't know what that 50 buys until May, then, we're all out of sequence again, which I grant you, you know, we're out of sequence because the petitioners chose to be out of sequence. But I also thought I heard town meeting state pretty clearly that they want to be able to make a judgment about where going beyond the 50,000, which would be its space somewhere on JCPC, falls in comparison to all the other things that are on the JCPC plant. If we don't get something back for our 50,000, if we don't get the 50,000 product, before town meeting starts, they won't be able to make that kind of judgment. So 
I'm confused. I will, uh, I'll offer a little suggestion here. What, what's likely to happen, and we, we do this with, with other things. I mean, dredging of Puffer's Pond is a perfect example. Uh, 12.5 million for a, for a fire station. That was a number that got generated relatively reasonably, but it's set there for eight years or whatever, and it was no longer a reasonable number, and yet that's the number that was in the JCPC report. So what's likely to happen is that staff will, you know, ballpark it as best they can given what they're what they know now and it will be wildly inaccurate but it will it will be of an order of magnitude that will be sufficient for jcpc discussions would be i guess the best way to characterize it is that it's of the right size to you know have the conversation in in broad terms which is all that can happen at this point until we get more and then potentially you know if if the designer comes back in may then jcpc could potentially sort of refine their statement on the floor of town meeting perhaps but maybe not depending so can i follow up so i'm confused mm -hmm. because it, we can make that number up today we could have made that number up two weeks ago and right. put it in the jcpc report it's got zero to do with the fifty thousand dollars when it comes right down to it right. it has to do with the scope of what they're talking about right. doing mm -hmm. and we can put some figure mm -hmm. on that we can pop that into a jcpc report right now we're saying that we're going to do that and we're not actually going to have any results of the $50,000 work until town meetings already started based on the way what I'm trying to understand is based on yeah timeline it's their well, timeline that's a long time I'm trying to understand this from the standpoint of I'm not arguing okay if we could stop <laughs> arguing about this I'm trying to understand how quickly we can turn this around right. so that town meeting okay let's be blunt doesn't accuse us of stalling because right. that's what they're going to accuse us of I can tell you that right now so how do we how do we explain this to them mr. Steinberg to explain early on we need to get an answer as early as we can but we need to explain to them as quickly as we feasibly can that there is an uncertainty because of two different bylaw uh, of a bylaw and an appropriation passed at the same town meeting that if uh, one triggers the other then um, there's an additional factor in doing the design and calculation of cost that um, we that is just not within the, our experience because the, it's two new things happening at the same time the and uh, I don't know what else to say well I, a, I would suggest I would suggest that just separate from that which I think yeah. is also a complicating factor but I think separate from that just the general process that we go through it takes time will be such that it won't happen any faster than that so independent of whether we apply or don't apply zero net zero energy or not I think just the general time. sort of timeline of of going through the yeah, due diligence long. that we have to by statute is likely to sort of extend us well into the new year I mean uh, you may have a different opinion about that but given you know that you're saying that just big designers mid-February got to give the person time to, fast to do the work yeah. that's really it's fast yeah. I don't so, think we can even do it that fast right so again it's a week from town meeting we've you know right. we're well, assembling we our um, RFP material um, it will go out as quickly as we can as, as soon as I get familiar with what the design requirements are um, there's some decisions that we have to that you will have to make or we'll have to make along the ways do you want to have a designer selection committee I mean I'm, mm -hmm. I, what I've said instructed people is tell me what how we've done things in the past and let's <clears throat> get moving on it um, there are certain uh, advertising requirements for a project of this size you have to put it in the central register it has to be there for 20 days or something like that before mm -hmm. people can respond mm -hmm. you have to give people mm -hmm. an adequate amount of time to respond and then mm -hmm. January is pretty much spent looking at yeah. proposals that have come in there's some question whether it's wise to put something out and try to get it moving before the holidays a lot of people you know it's, it's no. just you know we're managing this we when we just did it mapped out the actual time frame it was like the end of january if we did everything like boom 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 so we said i'm saying mid-february for the selection you know so you've had a group of people you analyze the results negotiate the fee selected a designer and then that designer has to say how quickly can you start 
you know, they don't, sometimes they consider it, I'm coming in tomorrow, but sometimes they put it on their work plan. They're not sure if they're going to get this project or not. So there are, you know, I think anybody would recognize that there are times, and it's public bidding. We also have to comply with the law on that. That's cool. So a couple things. Um, I think it's great that, you know, staff is taking it seriously and getting things moving, but there's a lot of moving parts to this. and. Um, you know, we didn't set this ball in motion, and we're doing it a, partly by a prescribed legal process that's going to take an amount of time. I see the 50000 as getting us to go. It's design development. It's not designing anything, really. Mm -hmm. It's having those conversations about programming. It's talking to people who worked on this, who have a vision. It's all of that and getting a program together and then <clears throat> creating some options and maybe having a squishy cost estimate at the end of that. And in, in my own experience, these things take time. I, I'm not worried about, maybe I should be, town meeting criticizing us for not having this all done by spring town meeting. And to me, that's totally unrealistic. To do this right is gonna take longer. Um, and it's just gonna get us to go. Um, what I'm more concerned about is having an inclusive process as we select a designer and we make those choices in that the people who wanted this feel like they've had some input. And that also takes time, because that means figuring out who's going to be part of that, what the representation is, a series of meetings that are open meetings. And um, if we just go ahead and for the sake of getting it as fast as absolutely possible, and we just do it as an administrative decision, I think we'll pay more political consequence for that than having to go to town meeting and say, the process is underway. We don't have all the answers yet. When we do, we'll be back with more hard facts and more hard dollar requests. I'm less worried at this point, I think, the detail about which of those new bylaws applies is, isn't really the point. I think it's understanding how